Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's hearing. Today, we're going to hear further evidence from Dr. Uh, Smith of the BRE. So, would you ask Dr. Smith to come back in, please? Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Smith. Good morning. That's it. Sit down. Make yourself comfortable. Thank you. <clears throat> Ready to carry on? Yes, Good. thank you. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Williams. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, members of the panel. Good morning, Dr. Smith. Uh, last night, uh, we were looking at the topic overall of harmonization, and we'd been examining the radar report from May 2000 and the working party minutes from May 2001. You'll recall that. Yes. I'd like to turn next, but in the same context, please, to CLG 401109. Now, this is an email from Wilf Ball of Brufma, the British Rigid Urethane Foam Manufacturers Association, to Anthony Bird at the then DETR, dated the 31st of January 2002. The subject is CPA Fire Group meeting to discuss the CPA response to the European Supplement Proposal for Approved Document B. Uh, and if you... Um, uh, go down, please, to the last paragraph there. Um, you can see what he says. Before I ask you about that, uh, were you familiar with this organisation, Brufma? Um, yes, they were a trade association, and mm. I think they were one of the partners in the radar project. Yes, and I think they're now called the IMA, the Insulation Manufacturers Association. Did you know that? No, I not Right. That may, may be true, I don't know. Now, looking at the paragraph uh, that starts furthermore, um, it reads as follows. I'll show it to you. Furthermore, there are foil-phased polyurethane products which obtain a class naught in the UK testing and therefore are available for internal linings of other circulation spaces, including the common areas of flats and maisonettes, that gave in the radar testing only a class D. Similarly, a foil-phased phenolic product with a class naught in the UK system only obtained a class C in the European classification, so they would not be able to also be used in this classification, which they have previously been accepted in. So, previously acceptable safe products would be prevented from continuing in their application, and in other cases, products that had been established as dangerous in that application before would now be permitted unless some mechanism can be introduced to correct these anomalous situations. I think you will agree this should not happen. Now, first, have you ever seen this email before now? Um, I don't recall it. Did Anthony Bird ever discuss this email or its contents with you? Um... Well, insofar as this was apparent anyway from the radar project, mm. it would have been discussed at the radar meetings and, and so on. Right. Did anybody ever tell you that although industry knew very well that some foil-faced PUR class naught product only scored C and D, its view, industry's view, is that raising the standard to B, quotes, should not happen? Um, I guess it would have been, yes, I would have been aware of that from discussions at the, at the radar meetings. Was it your view that Brufma's position that this should not happen was justified? Um, not within the context of um, safety, no. Not within the context of safety, but within the broader context of harmonisation, um, your in, view? Depending on the um, objectives, I mean, which would not be something that we would have a view on at all um, in relation to um, enabling the trade to, um, you know, that, them to continue to trade, if you like. That, that's a, a, a different decision for other people to be taking. And was it your view uh, that in order to achieve harmonisation across the board, uh, it was necessary or justified to allow some dangerous products in? Um, it depends. No, I don't think I, I would have had that view at the time. I... What was done to stop that happening? Well, I don't believe that in this context, for example, the um, classifications that were transposed into the approved document took any notice of this email. For example. 
not the email specifically necessarily, but as a matter of principle, do you know what the government did in order to ensure that, as the words say here, products which had been established uh, as safe would be prevented from continuing in their application because they didn't meet the tougher standards of the European <laughs> testing regime? No, I don't know. You don't. Can we move forward a year to 2002 uh, and go to CLG 50720, please? Now, this is the next meeting of the Part B Working Party held on the 15th of April 2002. Uh, and you were present at that, as was Anthony Bird, mm -hmm. yes? Yes. As you can see. Uh, and you can see from this minute uh, that uh, the, uh, if you go to um, the next page, that it went through the minute of the previous meeting, the 10th of May meeting. Uh, and if we go to page three at paragraph 6.7, uh, you can see that it says this, paragraph 620, and this is 620 of the previous meeting note of the, um, of the 10th of May meeting. Uh, and this re uh, returns to the investigations that the BRE had been asked to carry out in relation to the index figures for class naught. And it says this, it has not been possible to conclusively answer the question over the index one or I, rather, criterion, in diagram 45 of ADB, it was suggested that by stipulating an index value of not more than 20, the original authors of this requirement stroke guidance were attempting to exclude a certain type of material whose performance would have been on the poor performance side of 20. It is not clear which type of material this would have been, but it was likely to have been one used extensively in external cladding. It was also acknowledged that much of the guidance stroke regulation for external cladding developed as a result of the Summerland fire, August 1973. Post-meeting note, the fire propagation test has existed since 1963, and index one not more than 20 provision was int first introduced into building regulations in 1972. The department no longer holds the BRAC stroke FAP papers from around that time. Uh, can we take it that your investigations into this question after the meeting in May 2001 had not been successful? Um, yes, I think that's probably correct. And it was the effect of that, that the basis for the stipulation in diagram 40, that below 20 metres as it started, but now below 18 metres, a material with an index less than 20 should be used, was unknown and could not be discovered? Um, that certainly seems to be the case. And it's right, isn't it, that this particular stipulation was nonetheless not amended in any way uh, when it came to the 2002 Euro amendments? Um, yes, in terms of the requirement against the national test, you mean? Yes. Yes. Yeah. In fact, I don't think it was amended in uh, 2006 to 7 either. Um, I don't know without, without looking. As right. I say, the context to all of that, as we discussed yesterday, was you know, the expectation that these would all be removed from the approved document you know, at some point anyway. I see. So it didn't concern you terribly because was it your view that this would all come out and be replaced at some, yes. at some time in the future by the Euro norms? Yes. Yes, I see. Moving on with the minutes then of the meeting, can we go please to page four, paragraph 10? Uh, and at the top of the screen, you see it says this. Anthony Bird went on to make the very important point that at present CE marking is not mandatory, underlined, in the UK. The UK is one of five member states in the EU who have not made CE marking mandatory, the others being Ireland, Finland, Sweden and Portugal. The UK currently utilises our own British standards, mainly the BS476 suite of documents. However, these will eventually be withdrawn. Now, looking at that, is it right that it had been decided by then that, the, that CE marking would not become mandatory in the UK? Um, it wasn't and wouldn't become. I'm, I'm not sure that that's the case. I mean, it was decided at that particular point, but of course that was based upon, my understanding was, a legal interpretation of the Construction Products Directive by the UK and these other countries. And of course, that then became the subject of potential 
legal action by the European Commission and then led to the um, what became the Construction Products Regulation to ensure that it was mandatory across all member states. Yes, I see. At any rate, we can see from this paragraph uh, that it says that the 476 suite of documents would eventually be withdrawn. Uh, that, was that decided at this meeting or was that simply recording an intention by government which, had, which predated this, this meeting? Um, my interpretation of that is that that was a statement of a decision that had been taken not at this meeting but was reflecting the government's Commitment. You say your interpretation. That, that's yes. an interpretation of the and, and that, that was your my understanding. Yeah, and that, that was my understanding, as right, I say, I that there was an expectation that that's what was going to happen. Can we move two paragraphs down to paragraph 12, please, which is at the bottom of your screen? And we'll need <coughs> to scroll up a little. But it says this. Members asked whether it would be possible for construction products to be acceptable in the UK when they are deemed unacceptable in other member states. It was confirmed that this is possible, although that situation currently exists with individual national regimes in place. Um, and then over the page, the products must be shown to satisfy the building regulations of each member state, whether the CE marking is affixed or not. And let's just read on to the next two paragraphs. One member was concerned that although the CE marking is affixed to a product, that product may not be acceptable in all member states if some states set, set higher standards of performance in order to satisfy their own building regulations, which could be a technical barrier to trade. It was explained that for the purposes of the construction product directive, this would not be a technical barrier to trade. The different standards of performance in each member state are a commercial reality which would be for manufacturers to consider. In light of this, members expressed concern that if the UK were to continue by not making CE marking mandatory, it would become a dumping ground for inferior products that could not be sold in other member states. Anthony Bird explained that this would be no different for, to the situation that exists today, and that, for example, the building regulations provide a means of control over materials and workmanship through Regulation <laughs> 7. The Construction Products Directive has brought about the first step in removing the complications faced by a manufacturer, having to test to diff 15 different tests to be able to market their product through the 15 member states. Now, do you remember who expressed concern that the UK might become a dumping ground for inferior products if CE marking was not mandatory? I don't know. Did you share that concern yourself? Um, I don't recall. I, I don't, un, you know, I can't remember the context of this. Did you agree that in April 2002 it was the case that it would be no different to the situation that exists today, as in, in then? Um, yeah, largely. I, I would have agreed with that, yes. So was it the case that the UK was a dumping ground for inferior products that couldn't be sold in member states? In 2002? No, I don't believe that, that to be the case. I mean, the, the regulatory requirements were there pre the Construction Products Directive, and I think the point that's being made here is that with the transposition, the um, new European classes um, would ensure to a large extent that the same products would be used and it wouldn't open the door to lots of other lower classification products being able to come into the UK market. Would it not? No. Um, well, what about a French manufacturer of, of uh, cladding panel, for example, um, that couldn't sell its products uh, in a, a country which required A1 or A2? Um, it could come here, do a 476, get class naught, and enter the UK market. Well, at the time, that was not the view that the... Um, transposition to the European classifications, which is what this is referring to, would open the door. So if there was a regulatory requirement in the guidance for um, Euro Class B or Class O, then um, you couldn't enter the market with a product that was Class 3 or Class D. No, indeed, but you could. That, that's the point that's being made here. I see. Uh, well, we can argue about what the text means. I'm really after your recollection. Do you have an independent recollection of of um, the uh, of discussion along the lines of UK being a dumping ground for inferior products that couldn't be sold in other member states? No, I don't. You don't. Let's go on then to the next meeting in May 2002 at CLG 401462. 
and you can see the date, you can see who was in attendance, you were, as was Anthony Bird again, and if we go please to page 2, paragraph 6.1, we can see what you say there. Uh, and there's a paper being considered. Um, I'm sorry, can we scroll up just a little bit to a little bit higher up the page, you can see there's a heading, item four, reaction to fire. Anthony Bird introduced this paper and with Debbie Smith proceeded to talk members through the detail of its content. And then if you look at 6.1, uh, under uh, uh, paragraph seven, which I think is a reference to paragraph seven in the paper, uh, the note records you saying this, Debbie Smith explained that the radar project is all we have, but despite its criticisms, it is considerably more than most member states have undertaken. The action proposed in the WP paper was agreed. What were the criticisms of the radar project to which you were referring there? I don't recall at this time. I mean, it could well have been um, the distribution of products that had been submitted. I mean, we spoke yesterday, or, or you asked the questions yesterday, around um, one of the points that had been made, um, and it may be that that all linked together. But I, I don't recall firsthand. Right. Um, Do you remember who made those criticisms? No, I don't. Were they internal to the working party, do you recall, or were they from industry or other experts? Yeah, I, I, I can't help on that, I'm afraid. Did you share those criticisms? Did you espouse them yourself? I, I can't recall what, what this point was really... Um, no, I, I, don't, I don't recall. Can we go please to page 3, paragraph 6.7, and there's a heading next to paragraph 42, Plastisol, uh, and uh, that says this. Anthony Bird introduced this issue by reference to the three letters from Chorus, formerly British Steel. He explained that what is being sought by Chorus is a deemed to satisfy provision for Plastisol products. These products, which may currently achieve class naught under the relevant British standard test, are showing that they will generally only achieve class C under the new European test. The transpositions proposed for ADB are for class B to be substituted for class naught in time. Now, just pausing at that point, we looked, I think, earlier at, at a set of minutes from the 10th of May meeting yesterday, in which you had suggested to the working party, just for our note at paragraph 6.8, that class naught should be replaced with Euro class C. D do you remember no, that? No, it was B, wasn't it? Well, there's a reference the to Euro class C, which I don't think you could explain. Yes, but it was the radar project that had suggested class C. The, the proposal from, um, for the European supplement was to replace class O with class B. I see. So can you, can you explain, then, the difference? In the reason I ask... Well, let's, let's go back to the set of minutes, then, because there may be some confusion. Let's keep this on the page, and can we please go back to CLG 407308, which is the minutes of the 10th of May meeting, paragraph... And I'd like to go, please, in that, paragraph 6.8 on page 9, which is now on the screen in front of you. Um, you see that? Oh, right, OK, you're talking about not, not the main transposition in... OK, I understand where, what, what you're saying. Yes. yes. So, okay. so looking at that, mm. and I asked you about that yesterday. Mm. Yes. I suggested to you, in an attempt yes. to assist, that, that might be a reference to the parts of the building in Diagram 40 under 18 metres, yes. but you didn't... No, I, I You didn't yeah. know. So, so my question is, is, between the 10th of May 2001 and the 2nd of May 2002, had anything changed in your mind... Or, or, uh, or generally, perhaps, to lead to a consensus that Class B should become the appropriate replacement for Class... or uh, um, appropriate signifier for Class Nought rather than Class C? Um, that would have been based upon the um, correlation achie achieved with the Radar 2 project. But had work been done to push it up from C to B um, by, your, by, by the working party? work as in, well, they would have considered the information that was put to them. I mean, they wouldn't have gone away and done sort of any experimental work, I doubt. And what was the rationale behind the decision? I, I don't recall. Do you remember whether there was any disagreement? No, I, I don't recall. I would have thought if there had been, it would have been recorded in the, in the notes of do, the meeting. Do you remember what the views of Anthony Bird and the others from the department were? Um... 
well, they would have taken they would have taken the discussion that took place at the working party and and would have gone with what they considered to be the consensus view. And, and that was their ultimate decision, was it? Um, well, you'd have to ask them. Yeah, but from your perspective, that that was my understanding. Right. Yes, that they would go with um, the consensus right. view in terms of what to go out in terms of consultation. Did you yourself personally? agree, personally, professionally, agree that Class B was the appropriate replacement for Class Nord? Um, yes, you as did. opposed to Class C, yes. As opposed to Class C, yes. yes. But even in, even in respect of Class B, did you have any reservations of any kind? Um, no, that the bulk of the data was supporting that. Despite the defects in the data that we looked at yesterday? Yes, right. but also understanding that you know, you, you're, compare, you're not comparing like with like. Um, can we then go back to the minutes of the 2nd of May 2002 meeting, which we were on before, under the Plastisol heading? It's now on your screen. CLG 401462, page 3. It says, The working party members expressed some sympathy with Chorus's concerns. However, they agree that there are many products that may not meet the proposed European classifications and to make exceptions for individual products could open the floodgates for a raft of manufacturers to request similar privileges. The members also acknowledged that the period of coexistence would give the manufacturers time to re-engineer their products if they wanted to attain a higher European classification whilst continuing to specify in relation to the existing British, British classification until the coexistence ends. The agreed action is not to make a special case for Plastisol, did you yourself share the sympathy expressed for Chorus here? Um, I don't recall whether I um, whether I felt sympathetic or not. I mean, I understood the um, technical reason why Plastisol was achieving the results that it was achieving, um, but I mean, I. I I wouldn't have felt particularly sympathetic or not. I mean, it, my, my role was not to to operate within that space. No, I understand that. Um, would you uh, uh, accept, looking at the minutes at least, and doing the best you can with your recollection, that the, me that the members of the department present were very well aware that there were many products on the UK market at the time uh, achieving class naught, which would not be capable of achieving, achieving class B, Plastisol being one of them? Um, well, they would have been aware that some were when, you know, when they received letters and so on. They wouldn't have been aware, you know, that there, there were very many. Um, you, you're only aware when that is evidenced. Right. And at this time, there were not a huge amount of manufacturers actually carrying out testing to the European norms. So the body of evidence was fairly low, but obviously was growing and would continue to grow over, over time. Um. Well, just help me with that then, because <clears throat> you say in that last answer they wouldn't have been aware that there were very many, but, but the, the passage I've just read to you um, says uh, in the second line, however, which is in the middle of the block of text, however, they agreed that there are many products that may not meet the proposed European classifications, and to make exceptions for individual products could open the floodgates for a raft of manufacturers to request similar privileges. Did, not, did that not indicate um, that, in fact, this problem was not limited to a handful of products that achieve class naught but might not achieve the European classifications, but potentially a flood? But this is, in my, in my opinion anyway, that this reads as a perception of the people that were sat around the table. Um, it wasn't evidenced by a great big pile of um, classification reports that showed that to be the case. You know, you could envisage that other products that um, had a, a thin plastic coating, such as Plastisol or whatever, as uh, on their surfaces, may perform in the same way. But the evidence wasn't there at that time. It was only those manufacturers that had done the yeah. testing that were able to put their case. So, th th for me, this, this was more of a perception than, than a fact at that time. I understand that, and uh, but, but from a, as a person present at the meeting, was it your perception that the government understood, although they haven't the precise numbers or 
products or identification of manufacturers, they were aware that there was a non-negligible risk that out there, there were class naught products that might very well not achieve the Euro norm tests. Yes, because there, there, there was already some evidence. Yes. Yes. Do you, looking at the words um, re-engineer, re-engineer their products if they wanted to attain a higher European classification, do you, do you know what that was a reference to, what that meant? Well, the area that I'm aware that that, that was used mainly was in the fire resistance area where the European norms were considered to be more severe in terms of the thermal um, um, assault on the sample. And so the performance of the products tended to be downgraded. And in order to achieve, say, 30 minutes fire resistance to the European um, test standards for quite a few of the products that were tested in the Radar 1 um, project, they needed to be um, reinforced in some way to actually achieve the 30 minutes that they would need to still be placed on the market. So, you know, fire doors might... I, I'm, go I'm going to stop you because yeah. I, I, yeah. I fear that you... you and it may be my fault for not showing you the full document. Okay. Um, but I, I thought I had. If you go to the back to page two, you're, we're dealing here with uh, with a subject under item four, which is reaction to fire. Yes. And if you go, please, on to page three, at the foot of the page, that's where you see the discussion about fire resistance. Okay. So looking at the context of the expression re-engineering, is it really right that it was about resistance to fire and not reaction to fire? Well, that, that I mean, maybe there was a discussion around that um, under reaction to fire as well, but I'm most familiar with the discussion around fire resistance, as I say, where the performance was, um, was generally lower across the board because the test method had changed. Um, but I suppose, yes, the same kind of concept would apply here if a manufacturer wanted to achieve a class B and they were only achieving a class C, they would have to consider what they needed to do to their product if they wished to sell it into, you know, a particular yeah. application. Yes. And re-engineering might involve, what, adding different products, putting facings on that were more robust? What, what would that involve? Can yeah, you I mean, I, it's not for me to say. I mean, it would depend on the product um, as, as to what they would need to do. I mean, and each manufacturer and, and sector are, are experts in right. in the performance of their products. I mean, that's not an expertise that I particularly have in terms of the manufacture of products. Was the general thinking, just tying all the threads together then, uh, on this document and the earlier one, that by transposing class naught to class B, after the transition period, that might reduce the market for class naught products, which only achieved C and D. But that was acceptable because it would force manufacturers to adopt higher standards of safety. Um, yes, I think that was the general consensus. But during the transition period, class naught products that only achieved classes C or D under the Euro norms could still be accepted in the United Kingdom. Um, yes, if they were still relying on their class naught classification. Now let's go to CLG 401464. This is the final regulatory impact assessment on the proposed amendment of the building regulations, uh, approved document B, uh, adoption of harmonised European system of fire testing. And you'll see a date at the very top of the document, 30th of May 2002. So this is about uh, four weeks or so after the meeting. Uh, that we've, we've just been, the minutes of which we've just been looking at. And uh, it, were you involved in drafting this document? No, I mean, there were specialist people that, that dealt with regulatory impact assessments. Did you see it before it was um, pro published or promulgated? Um, I don't recall. Right. Do you know who at the BR, at the, well, do you know whether anybody at the BRE had any role in this document? I don't recall. Who were the specialist people that dealt with regulatory impact assessments? Um, the department had people. They had um, guidelines in terms of the, the, the issues that needed to be 
um, considered. I mean, I couldn't name individuals that were involved in that. Right. Was Brian Martin involved in it? He was still at the BRE at this time, of course. Yeah, I don't know. I don't would doubt it, because it, I mean, it involved um, sort of economic considerations and so on. Let's go down to page three, paragraph 15. And that deals with the stages in which changes will be introduced. And it says this, to assist manufacturers from, of construction product, products in adapting to the new test methods in support of applying the CE marking, the European Commission proposes to introduce them in three stages. One, from a date to be decided, all national fire regulations and supporting technical documents, in this case Part B, must specify standards of fire performance in terms of the new tests while also retaining their existing national test specifications. This is the start of the transitional period. Two, a number of years <coughs> after this, conflicting national test methods, in this case probably much of the BS 476 series, must be withdrawn by the relevant national standards organisation, in this case the British Standards Institution, and all new products will have to be tested to the new harmonised standards. Existing products with certificates can continue to be sold. Three, a number of years after this, there will be a requirement that only products tested to the new harmonised standards can be placed on the market. And then if you go over the page to paragraph 16, page 4, based upon the current available information, it is felt that the most likely start date of the transition period will be 2002, stage 1, and that the transition period will have a duration of at least three years, stage 2. In this transition period, it will be possible to use products tested either by the existing British standards or by the new European harmonised fire test, and therefore during this time both test methods must be covered by the approved document. Now, um, I've shown you that text at length, but we can pick out some phrases such as a date to be decided and a number of years after this. Do you know why the timing of these stages was still not definitive? No, I don't. That would have been a policy matter. You don't? You, do, were you involved in or do you know anything of any discussions about the possible dates for each stage and the period of transition? No, I don't. Is it right that the final decision on those matters would rest with the department? Absolutely. Now, looking at, um, at paragraph 16, as we've seen, <coughs> uh, it, it, it says the most likely tran the start date of the transition period would be 2002 uh, and would last for three years, at least three years, yes? Yes. Do you remember who had suggested 2002 as the start date? Um, I guess that coincided with the... Um, intended publication of the European supplement. Right. And, and do, you, do you remember when, in 2002, that was? What, that the European supplement yes. was entered into force? So, that, so, that, so as to start the transition period? Well, it would have either been in the April or the October, because I can't remember exactly, but the documents were published and then entered into force either in the April or October. Right. Well, it would have been October, then, that I think, year. given that okay. the... Um, that this document is dated May. OK. And well, that you were still considering October. it in May. Yes. Yeah. Do, you, do, you, do you remember who had su suggested a period of at least three years for the transition? No, I don't. Or the rationale for it? No, I don't. Did you consider at any stage that keeping both the national class and the European class side by side might cause confusion? Well, there was no evidence, I think, at that time that um, it was going to cause confusion. Um, there'd, there'd been no feedback that I was aware of at that time. Can we agree that this transition plan, as stated in this document, was never implemented? Um, well, you, you presumably don't quarrel with that. Not formally, no, it wasn't enacted in the way that it's, it's laid out here. Do you know why that was? No, I don't. Do you know at what stage it was abandoned? No, I don't. Or why it was abandoned? No. Or whether any new plan was made? No. No, I don't. Was industry and economic pressure a factor in, do you know, in not following a three-year transition plan as set out in this document? I, I don't know that. Having expressed the view in May 2001 that no direct equivalence between national and euro classes was possible, did you ever later change your view? 
What, that there was a direct correlation? Yes. No. Did you ever ask anybody in the department what had happened to the original plan to have a transition period for three years running from 2002? I don't recall whether we ever had that explicit conversation, no. Did you ever wonder why it was that, at any stage, uh, there had been no end date to Class Nought, and that the two regimes had been allowed to run in tandem from 2002 until 2018, after the Grenfell Tower fire? Did you ever wonder? Um, I mean, various at various stages, the department would explain where they were um, in terms of you know, the context of what was happening in the market at that time in relation to Europe and the construction products directive, then the construction products regulation, and so on. So um, it's very difficult. You know, it, it was a, an evolution, if you like. It wasn't a, a specific discussion. Did anybody ever explain to you, or did you ever ask, uh, what, what had happened uh, to the proposal to have a transition period and why it had been replaced with uh, a, a rolling postponement. Yeah, I, I don't recall that specific conversation. Did you ever seek it out? Well, I, I, can't, I don't recall right. doing so, no. Now let's go to the approved document, which is CLG 140740 uh, at 91. We'll go straight into it. The, um, this is uh, diagram 40, uh, as amended by the uh, European amendments. At CLG 140740, page 91. Uh, and uh, I'm going to assume that this document is familiar to you, and I just want to focus uh, on parts of it. If we look, please, at the right-hand side towards the bottom of the diagram, uh, you can see uh, the middle box, um, which relates to parts of the building over 18 metres, in the case of a building... A thousand millimetres or more from the boundary, or the whole of the building if it's more than 18 <coughs> metres, if it's less than a thousand millimetres from the boundary. So it's the middle box and it says class naught, national class, or class B, S3, D2, or better, European class. Yes? Yes. Uh, and there's a disclaimer if you look under the notes which says this the national classifications do not automatically equate with the equivalent European classifications. Therefore, products cannot typically assume a European class unless they have been tested accordingly. Now, were you involved in discussions about the amendment of Diagram 40 to produce it in this form? Um, yes, and I was certainly involved in um, the note number one down there. You were involved in it. What was the extent of your involvement? Um, I mean, it was important. I mean, in drafting that, the discussions around that were to prevent manufacturers thinking, well, I'm Euro class, um, sorry, I'm national class naught, and therefore I can simply claim that I am Euro class B. Did you have any role in the actual drafting? Um, well, I would have seen it and, and discussed it probably in um, the meetings around the drafting of the European supplement that you, you've been looking at, right. th those um, notes. Right, now, let's, let's look meetings. at that. So you would have discussed it in meetings around the drafting. H who had the pen? Um, well, no one person has the pen. Well, uh, um, who was ultimately responsible for deciding the language of that note? Um, well, I say, somebody would produce an Aunt Sally, if you like, and then that would be discussed and put to the working party, who would then discuss it and decide if it made sense, might do some wordsmithing and might 
um, require some changes before it's then sent out to consultation to receive feedback. And again, it might then subsequently change. Did you, uh, well, who was involved in the, in the process of deciding those words? Who sat around the table? Um, well, I say it would be the working party. Right. Um, ultimately. Did you consider that it was clear enough to the likely readership? Um, yes, otherwise, you know, it wouldn't have, uh, it wouldn't have gone forward, I, I would um, suggest. I mean, the likely readership was a range of, of people in the United Kingdom, including subcontractors working on refurbishment projects who might not have specialist fire safety or fire engineering background. Did you consider that? Not explicitly, no. Um, you know, our, our view, my view, um, BRE's view has, has been around that, that if somebody doesn't understand something or isn't clear, then you would expect them to go and find a professional that does understand and can advise them as to what something means. Not to say, well, I don't understand it or I'm confused by it, but I'll just make it up as I go along. I mean, you, you would expect people to act professionally and, um, you know, seek out support. And that might involve going directly to the department for, you know, an explanation if they were unclear. Or oh, is that sure. right? So, just to understand that, did, did you think... Is it your view that the department would be the ultimate authority on explaining the intended meaning behind any expression, language, or wording in approved document B? Yes, absolutely. Did that view ever change? No. Did you ever have any discussions with anybody in the department about that being your expect expectation of them? Um, yes, I mean, it was always clear. It was always clear that the only people that could actually give an official view as to what was meant would what what was them. Right. It was when you their say document. Them, you mean the department. Yes, yes, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yes. yes. Um, looking at the language, um, the national classifications do not automatically equate. What was the what did you understand the word automatically there to denote? I've never really um, thought about it. Did you say that? I mean, you could argue that's a bit of a redundant word, really. <laughs> well, it's not really adding very much. Well, why is it in there then? Do you know well, I, no, I say I've okay. not really considered that. Um, in fact, it's right, isn't it, that there was no equation at all, automatic or otherwise, between class naught and class B. Correct. And indeed, you'd said so yourself. Mm-hmm. D did you not think at the time that that might introduce some confusion between some people, well, because some people might think that it was an achievable, or there was an achievable equation between class naught and class B, although not automatic? No, quite. The intention of this was quite the reverse, was to remove that confusion. Well, I see. To prevent manufacturers automatically, if you like, um, saying I've got a class O product, product therefore I'm going to brand it and um, market it as a, as a European class B. Uh, looking at the word equivalent, what did you understand the word equivalent there to denote? Um, well, equivalent in terms of the transposition. Did you not think that some people might take from this note that the Euro class B was equivalent to class naught, the equivalent European classification? No, not at the time. Not at the time. You can see, can't you, how some people might think, well, class zero or class naught or class O is equivalent to class B, S, 3, D, naught, but just not automatically. I've never read it that way. But it can be read that way, can't it? 
Um, and to be honest, I've, I've, I was never made aware that anybody was reading it that way. Nobody had ever raised that as an issue um, that I'm aware of with BRE or, you know. Given or, the... Sorry. Sorry, I'm so sorry. I, I, okay. I cut across you. D given that the test methods, the setups, the measurements under each of the regimes were so extensively different, as you and I have agreed over the last uh, day or so, with only very sl slim areas of commonality, do you know why that fact was not spelt out in clear terms in Diagram 40? Well, I think the, the view was that, that that's what that was doing, or attempting to do. Well, if I've understood you, if I've understood you correctly, perhaps what it should have said is that the national classifications do not equate to any European classification, because they do, there is no um, equivalence at all, is there? There isn't equivalence. Um, I mean, I think whatever way you present that you could equally have people that would misunderstand it. Um, yeah. So, I mean, what I would say is, uh, you know, around these, the publication of the 2002 version and then the 2006 version of the approved documents, there were presentations that were given to industry and the industry also made around the radar project and, and so on um, in, in an attempt to basically disseminate this information and, and, and try to make sure that it was clear to everybody. And I say I was never aware personally that there was particular confusion around this point. Why not say to the reader, your product for use on, in this part of these buildings either had to be class naught or class B, full stop. What was wrong with that? Well, potentially that could have been said as well, yes. What I'm suggesting to you is that the note introduces the confusion because people might think that there was a degree of equivalence or achievable equation between the two, whereas in fact that was not the case. Well, as I say, I wasn't aware of anything at the time that was confusing, and this was discussed um, at length and also went out to consultation, and at no point was it raised as a particular problem or, or you know, anybody raised any concerns that it was unclear. Um, you know, I can't really add anything more than that. No, and, and the reason it may not be uh, have been seen as unclear is because people may well have thought that if it achieved class naught, it could be treated as class B, or if it achieved class B, it could be regarded as class naught. You can see why, can't you? Well, no, that's not my interpretation of that. Now, you, you told us yesterday, I think, uh, as a result of looking at the 2001 tests, and particularly test three, the ACMP e product under CC 1924, which had been terminated early and with the flames reaching 20 metres, twice the height of the rig, that that product achieved class naught, but a Euro rating of D. Um, is it right that you therefore knew, uh, and can we assume government also knew, that if a builder opted for a class naught product, for the external wall of a high-rise building above 18 metres, which Diagram 40 allowed them to do, they might in fact be opting for a Class D or E product. Um, within the overall context of what we were doing at the time, yes, that, that was potentially possible. Um, I mean, I'm not aware that that was given or, or I gave that particular consideration at the time. But Specifically had, the point that you, you're, you're making there. But it had been given consideration, hadn't it, in the course of the harmonisation programme. That was one of the things that, the, that figure one or 
um, Table 8, which we looked at yesterday, showed you that there were some products that could achieve class 0, but nonetheless... Yes, less. yes, no, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So, so can you explain... So, so you accept, I think, that you went forward yourself, personally, and the government went forward with the retention of class naught or class B, knowing that some class naught products m might achieve a, a European class significantly inferior to class B, but would nonetheless be allowed on a UK building above 18 metres. Um, yes, and I mean, obviously, the radar reports were part of the consultation as well. Um, so, you know, that, that was evident at the time. But I think the premise from the departmental's, the, sorry, the department's point of view, and you, you would need to check this with them, was that the Class O products were permissible at that time anyway. Was any consideration given to the risks, the risks to life, presented by leaving Class Naught in Diagram 40 in this way? Um, not at that time, I don't believe, no. Did you see... Uh, that this amendment to Diagram 40, by giving an option, created a false sense of equivalence which the note didn't and indeed could never dispel? Well, the option was there pre the European norms anyway. And this was the chance there, wasn't it? Uh, to either to get rid of it completely uh, or at least to put it on a very short time fuse. Yes, but I mean that, as I said earlier, that was a policy decision. That's not something that we would be involved in. in indeed, but it was a policy decision, Are you, would you accept, uh, w w which was fraught with risk and which the government and you knew existed? Well, I say the, the, the situation was that prior to the 2002 amendment, all of these products were permitted for use and they were already permitted for use. And was any thought given at this point, when you were drafting these Euro amendments, to the recommendations made by the Select Committee on the 14th of December 2014? Um, I, December 2014? Sorry, 14th of December 20... Yeah. No, sorry, 14th of December 1999. Um, I don't recall. I, I don't recall that specifically. Uh, now, let's go to KIN 6060. Um, now, this is a, uh, a Kingspan technical bulletin entitled New European Fire Classification System. Technical bulletin, and then there's a big red stamp, the plain facts. So these are presenting facts. And um, it's dated May 2003. If you look at the very top right-hand corner, you can see that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you remember ever seeing this document before? I don't recall it. Right, let's just see how we go. Can we go to page two, please? Left-hand side, introduction, um, in bold. A new system of fire ratings, the Euroclass system, has been introduced by the EU and is set to eventually replace the BS476 series that is currently recognised within the UK. Uh, and um, then if you... Uh, look down, please, uh, at um, page two, left-hand side. There's a heading. Sorry, page three. There's a heading, replacement of the current cl class naught system. And the first paragraph says, following the final adoption of the new classification scheme, national fire classifications will be, will be phased out of, of use over a period of five to ten years. And if you go then to page five, sorry, I'm so sorry. Can we just stick with this? I'm so sorry. There's something in the next paragraph. The next paragraph uh, explains class one or class naught and then says this halfway through. Class naught correlates with Euro class B in the new regime. However, there are a number of products that are class naught based on BS476 tests that will not achieve a Euro class B. Now, you may, you may not have seen this document at the time, but is the sentence class naught correlates with a Euro class B in the new regime, reliable and accurate? Um, from my perspective, no. No. But you can see how industry was reading it, even at this stage. Yes? You didn't at the time, but you can see how they, yes. they were. 
Hmm. Now, uh, let's then go to page five, where you can see um, some text about delay in implementation. Um, there's large red text in the left-hand column which says, existing national fire standards are not set to be withdrawn for five to ten years. Now, this is May 2003, this document. Do you know, are you able to explain uh, what had happened between the transition, between the decision about the transition plan in uh, at the end of May 2002 and a year later, May 2003, to extend the uh, um, period of transition from three years to five to ten? No, I can't. Did you know, or had you heard, uh, in around May or by May 2003, that the transition period had been extended in that way? No, I don't recall that. If we look at the large red text in the right-hand column, page five also, it says, furthermore, HM government has stated that it will not implement the new euro class system until the industry is ready to adopt it. Do you know uh, anything about that decision? No, I don't. Do you know that it, whether the government had made that statement, as far as you are aware, by May? I'm not aware of it. Are you surprised? You look surprised to see that now. Yes. Right. Have you any idea how or where or from where Kingspan had picked up that idea? No. Did you ever have any discussion about it with any manufacturer, such as those people who were by, by now perhaps coming to the BRE for tests? Not that I'm aware of, no. Moving on in time then to March 2004, I think it's right that you were chair by that stage of the BSI committee in relation to FSH 21. Um, probably around that sort of time. I, yeah. I don't remember uh, exactly when, yeah. And that's reaction to fire, isn't it? It is, yes. Yeah. And I think 22 is resistance to fire. That's correct. Yeah. Now, can you tell us briefly <coughs> what standards were covered by that committee, by your FSH 21 committee? Yes, so it predominantly covers the European norms, so it mirrors the um, activities that are going on within SEN TC127. So that includes the um, BSEN um, ISO 1716, um, similarly, 1182, the single burning item test, the 13823, yep. and the small flame test, the 11925 part two. Um, also, the radiant panel flooring test, which is the um, EN ISO 9239 part two, I think it is. Now, you didn't mention BS476 in that answer. Um, BS476 sits within um, FSH21, but it is and has been at standstill since the 1990s. Now, at standstill, is that the same as obsolescence in BSI speak? Um, it means that because there are European norms, either in development or already published, then you do not undertake any work to basically update the, the, the standards for use within the context of CE marking and the European right. classification systems and the UK regulatory system. So it, it, it sat within the committee, but it was essentially frozen? Yes. yes. Let, let's go to BRE 407768, <coughs> please. Uh, now, we've gone on to page three of that document. I'm not sure there's much point showing you page one. It, well, there it is. It's the Milestone Progress Report, dated the 15th of March. Uh, sorry, dated the... Uh, I'm not sure there is a date, but it runs to the 15th of March 2004. Yeah. And at the very foot of the page, you'll see reaction to fire as task three. And then if we turn to page three, there's a third square bullet point under the heading FSH21. This is what I want to show you. And this is under the general heading reaction to fire tests. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a meeting, uh, 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 you came in in March that year. And it, the third bullet point says, a commercial need was seen for continuing availability of the BS476 standards in relation to business outside Europe. And this is being discussed with B12 fire coordination, the preferred option being to declare them obsolescent. In the case of part six, a modification will be needed to replace asbestos board, likely to be unavailable from the end of 2004. Any development work would need to be done by the test laboratories themselves. 
Now, who had raised or had become aware of this commercial need, so to speak? Um, I think it was BSI themselves. I mean, they, they, they were aware that um, the BS476 standards in general, not just reaction to fire, were being used um, as part of the regulatory frameworks in a number of overseas countries. Um, countries such as Hong Kong, um, Malaysia, and, and there, there were quite a few that were um, that were reliant upon these particular test methods. And did that include uh, BS four seven six part six and seven? Yes, it would have done. Right. And you say you think it was BSI themselves. Do you know who it was at the BSI who had identified this commercial need? No, I don't. So does that tell us that the, this committee, your committee, believed that there was a need in those countries, such as Hong Kong or Malaysia, um, to, to, for products to be able to be tested to BS476? Yes, because, uh, as I say, I, our understanding was that their regulations, as written, called up right. um, B, the BS476, Part 6-7 and other parts as the means to demonstrate the performance that they required within their... Um, buildings. I see. And what about within Europe and within the UK? Was there a perceived commercial need for BS 476 Part 6 and 7 to be retained here? Um, I, don't, I don't think that was the driver for this, no. Now, as far as you were aware, was the envisaged 2005 transition period end date still in place at this time, which is March 2004? Um, I don't recall precisely. You don't recall whether it had been extended or whether no, it was still I in place? No, I don't. Yeah, I... Now, when it says declared obsolescent, mm -hmm. I think it's right that that was BSI language for no longer updated but would be retained for a long working life. Yes, they have different categories of documents. Um, and yes, it, it, it... And for whom was the preferred option? as it says there, to declare the BS 476 standards obsolescent? That would have been BSI. And what was the alternative to the preferred option? What was the um, other option? I think withdrawn. Withdrawn, right. I think that's the other one. And why was the, this option, namely obs declared obsolescence, the preferred option? Um, I think there was some discussion around the perception of obsolescence as compared to withdrawn. And potentially, I mean, it may be that BSI had had some discussions with some of the overseas users of these documents to, um, you know, to determine how it would be perceived and, and whether it was, you know, what, what, which was the best way to go with that. I see. So, but was this ob preferred obsolescence targeted at businesses outside Europe where there was a commercial need? Was um, identified predominantly, yes. But what about the UK? Did anybody think uh, that by declaring 476 Part Six and Seven obsolescent but not withdrawn, that might also ha have an impact here? Um, I mean, the standards are literally that the British standards. They are they are published and they are um, technical standards and in, eff in, in effect they are the tools that go in the toolbox for others to then call upon and use. So, you know, the, the task of the standards committee is one to maintain and make sure the standards are as good as possible. It's not the task of the standards committee to tell people how or whether they should use the standards or not. Was there any discussion with the department at the time or within FSH itself about declaring 476 Part 6 and 7 obsolescent as opposed to withdrawn? Um, I don't know. You don't know? No, you, I you, don't. You can't recall or you? Well, I, I, there wasn't any? I don't know. I, I don't recall. And obviously here this discussion is about the standards as opposed to the application of the standards in any particular jurisdiction. Correct. Is there a difference? Yes. Right. So you could have, is this right, you could continue to have the standards, <coughs> even though obsolescent, for anybody in the world to use if they wanted to, or if their regulatory regime allowed it, but it would be up to each individual regulatory regime 
to decide whether or not that standard should be applied in any particular context. Correct. I see. Can we go to BRE 407802, please? Page one. This is a milestone progress report from the BRE to the department. So rather similar to the last document we've seen, we saw, um, and it's July 2004, and the department at the time, I think, was the ODPM. And if you go to the very bottom of the page, you can see that um, this project, uh, which is progress against contracted program in the period, uh, was, was a project managed by Corrine Williams, Dr. Williams, and approved by you, Dr. Smith. Mm -hmm. Date reported, date report completed 15th July 2004. Do you know to whom in the department that report was submitted? Um, it would have been submitted via the research management contractors, AEA Technology, through their portal. Right. Um, and was therefore available, I guess, for whoever in the department. Now, let's just look at page eight at. briefly. Mm. And I think you'll tell us that at the bottom of the page, this is about FSH 22. You see that? Yes. Uh, and in the middle of the page, uh, and in fact, I think we need to scroll up a little bit higher, the progress of the April meeting. Uh, and if, I'm so sorry to do this to you. If we, can we go back to page seven, please? Uh, foot of page seven, you can see FSH 22 fire resistance tests. I just want to make sure we've got something clear. Uh, and it talks about the progress of the September meeting. And it says underneath that, withdrawal of conflicting national standards, unresolved, meeting between ODPM and BSI still to be arranged. That Was that about fire resistance and the fire resistance tests that you were talking about earlier, as opposed to the re reaction to fire tests? Um. I don't know. I mean, if they were having a meeting, it would possibly uh, have covered all of the conflicting national standards. Do you know whether there was a meeting? No, I don't. Do you know whether there was any discussion? No, I don't. Right. Can we go to page nine then, second paragraph or second set of bullet points, please? Uh, and uh, that uh, sits under a heading from the previous page, FSH 22 two calculation methods. And in the second paragraph uh, on at page nine, in the second set of bullet points there, um, it says that uh, in, in the March meeting application tables were made. Uh, and then if you uh, if you look <clears throat> yes I'm so sorry page 8 progress of the April meeting was as follows the secretary agreed to explore the options available as alternatives to the outright withdrawal of BF 476 um, that's the April 2004 meeting of FSH 22, I think, isn't it? Um, well, I'm sorry, I don't you know. Go where scroll, you go scroll back to where I was, we were before on page 7. It starts on page 7, FSH 22, fire resistance tests, and then on page 8, if we go to that, the first, first bullet point under fire resistance tests, the withdrawal of conflicting there. The progress of the April meeting was as follows. The Secretary agreed to explore the options available as alternatives to the outright withdrawal of BS 476. Right. Now, that's, I think, the April 2004 meeting of FASH 22, isn't it? Yes, I believe Did so. you attend, do you know? No, I don't believe I did. Do you know, what the, um, do you know why the Secretary agreed to explore alternative options to withdrawal? No, I don't. Do you know whether they were talking about reaction to fire or resistance to fire tests? Well, within this context, it would have absolutely been fire resistance. Right. Can we then go to CLG 1000-4229, please? This is an email which starts on the bottom of page 1. 
B C L G one triple zero four two two nine. And if we go to the bottom of page one, we can see an email uh, from Chun Jin Cho, dated the 7th of December 2009. So this is some years later, to Anthony Bird. Subject BS476 and EN 13501. Dear Sir, straight madam, I am Mr Cho from the Fire Safety and Shelter Department, Singapore. Can I seek your assistance to clarify the equivalent standards of EN 13501 and BS 476? If you are not the officer concerned to answer my questions, my queries, I would appreciate very much if you could direct the questions to the relevant officer. Currently, Singapore is adopting BS 476 Part 4 slash 11 and Part 6 slash 7 to check the non-combustibility and flame spread properties of material respectively. There were many inquiries from suppliers on the use of EN standards instead of BS for the relevant test. We have checked the relevant information from the website and found that there were many write-up mentioning the equivalency... We aren't getting this on our screens at the moment. Uh, Mr. We, need Mr. To, we need to turn the page, please. Can we just do that? Thank you. I'll read paragraph two again. Currently, Singapore is adopting BS 476 parts 4 and 11 and part 6 and 7 to check the non-combustibility and flame spread properties of material respectively. There were many inquiries from suppliers on the use of EN standards instead of BS for the relevant test. We have checked the relevant information from the website and found that there were many write-up mentioning the equivalency of EN and BS standard as follows. And then you have UK class, Euro class, and you can see the, the equivalences, mm -hmm. uh, equivalency as he calls it. And you can see there, class naught. Uh, and under Euro class B or better, yes? Yes. Then he goes on, while we go through document B, there is mention of Euro class A1 and A2 considered as non-combustible and limited combustibility respectively, but there is no mention in document B that Euro class is equivalent to class 0, the S476 part 6 and 7, and Euro class C is equivalent to class 1 and 2. May I seek your good self? To clarify whether it is a regulation or mentioned in document B that the following are equivalent, and he sets out um, UK classes and Euro classes there in his lists. Thank you very much for your assistance on this matter. Uh, now, just picking up where he says there's no mention in document B that Euro class B is equivalent to class naught, parts of BS 476, part 6 and 7. You see that? Mm -hmm. Um, if we then go up the chain, please, to the next email on page one, we see uh, uh, Anthony Bird forwards this to you, Dr. Smith, mm -hmm. and to Brian Martin the same day, uh, a few hours later. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, there's then a response which comes back from you. Um, do you know why Anthony Bird forwarded that email to you? Why was that for you to deal with? Um, well, I mean, obviously he sent it predominantly to Brian, who was um, working to support him at the department on secondment several days a week um, and was presumably looking for, for my input as well as um, with my background knowledge in this area. Why do you say predominantly to Brian? This is 2009. And uh, Brian is in the department. Oh, is he? I beg your pardon. I think yes. he was still and at he's sending, then. And you're the first named recipient yes. of the email. So why do you say he was sending it predominantly to Brian? Yeah, I, I didn't realise Brian right, had I moved see. at that point. Right. Um, uh, uh, I would have thought, you know, because Brian would have taken the lead had he still been, the, you know, at BRE at that point. Um, I mean, and obviously from the um, email at the top... There was obviously a discussion, which I guess was on the phone, which um, Brian would have uh, probably called me about. And then he obviously asked us, or asked me to, to write up the basis of the discussion that we had. And uh, we can see that, well, before we go on, you, 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 what was your involvement with the department at this stage? I mean, clearly you were the points person, as I think you told us. The key account manager, yeah. The key account manager at the BRE. Yeah. Yes. But would you regularly be at the point of contact for queries such as this at this time? This is late 2009. I mean, I don't think they were that common. 
So, you know, you say regularly, I, it, it was very occasional. But when they came, you would be the person they would ask? Um, potentially. Um, I mean, I wouldn't, it wouldn't always um, sit with me to resolve them. I mean, it might be if it was something to do with um, sprinklers or something like that, then obviously it would be discussed with um, other colleagues. Now, let's go to the, the top of email in the chain. We can see that on the 22nd of December 2009, you sent a draft response to Brian Martin, uh, who, as I'd say, was no longer at the BRE but within the department, and reporting to Anthony Bird, I think. And you say, please see a draft response as discussed. Happy Christmas, Debbie. Um, did you discuss Mr Cho's email with Brian Martin? I assume I did, yes, based on what that email says. And what were his views about how to respond? I don't recall that. Did the subject of the abandoned transition period come up at all during your discussion with Brian Martin? I, I have no recollection of that. I mean, the, any discussion would have been focused, I guess, in terms of the questions that had been raised in the email. Well, yes, one question. One question sure. might be, well, why are we still having, why are we still being asked these questions? Well, I mean, that, I say, my role was not one to um, deal with the policy matters. That, that was for the department to deal with. Why were you drafting the response to him as opposed to Anthony Bird or Brian Martin? My guess is that um, Brian probably asked me on the, on, on the phone to summarise the discussion that we'd had. Was either Brian Martin or Anthony Bird not themselves clear on what Diagram 40 said or meant, and, and that's why they had to come to you for advice? No, I don't believe that. To why be were the they coming to you for advice? Do you know? Potentially um, workload. I mean, I, you, you would have to ask them. Well, I'm, I'm really asking you because you were the one who was asked to... To, to assist, and mm. your response was a draft response. I'm just seeking to understand w what your role was. Uh, did they just bat this off to you without explanation? I, uh, I don't recall at the time. I mean, uh, right. all, all I can see is what the outcome of this was. Mr Chairman, we're going to come to the response as yeah. drafted, <coughs> but now would be as convenient a moment as any. Would it? Yes. All right, well... We'll have the break now then. We'll stop, we'll uh, resume please at 25 to 12. And as before, please don't talk to anyone about your evidence while you're out of the room. Okay, thank right. you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Millett, 25 to 12, please.
Would you ask Dr. Smith to come back in, please? Right, Dr. Smith, you yes, have to carry you. on. Yes, thank you. Just a minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Smith, uh, let's go now then to the response that you drafted and sent to Brian Martin in the email we've just been looking at. It, this is at CLG 1000-4230. And it says, Dear Mr. Cho, re BS 476 and EN 13501. Thank you for your email regarding BS 476 and EN 13501 Part 1. There is no regulation that gives equivalency between BS 476 and EN 13501 Part 1. The only way that a manufacturer can declare a performance class for reaction to fire or fire resistance for their product is based on test evidence. Therefore, one, a BS 476 test can only be used to derive a BS 476 class such as class 0, 1, 2 or 3. A BS EN 13501 Part 1 classification, A1, A2, B, C, D, E, can only be derived from test data in accordance with the appropriate EM test methods, i.e. EN 1716, EN 1182, EN 13823, EN 1125 Part 2. For example, a manufacturer can only claim class naught if they have tested their product to BS 476 Parts 6 and 7 and met the class naught requirements. They cannot then claim a European Class B for their product without having tested it to EN 13.823 and EN 11.925 Part 2 and achieve the specified criteria for Class B. The concept of equivalency relates to the guidance that is provided in Approved Document B, Fire Safety to the Building Regulations 2000 ADB. ADB provides guidance on classes of reaction to fire, fire resistance and external fire exposure of roofs, performance that satisfy the re requirements of the building regulations. Under the Construction Products Directive European legislation, the UK must accept products that have been classified in accordance with the EN 13501 series of standards onto the UK market. Therefore, for each specified BS 476 class in ADB, a European class is defined so that is also considered to, have to satisfy the requirements of the building regulations. This approach has also been adopted in relation to non-combustibility, A1, and materials of limited combustibility, A2. Now, do you know whether your response was ever sent to Mr Cho? No, I don't. We don't have a record of it being sent. You, no, I mean, don't know. I wouldn't be copied in into that. In the light of Mr Cho's email, did you consider that ADB itself needed amending to make it clear that there was no equivalence between the European and national classes? Um, I don't know whether I did or not at that time. Probably not, um, given that uh, Mr Cho was from overseas. Um, it was probably a, a case of us explaining it in a more full way um, due to sort of language barriers. Why would Mr Cho, whose English seems to be certainly no worse than many uh, 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 people in this country who communicated by email that we've seen, be treated as different? Um, well, due to the nature and the detailed um, questions that he was asking, mm. and th this was an answer to those points. What was... Um, did you discuss this response uh, with Brian Martin, this draft? Well, I can only assume that I did, based on the email that you showed earlier, which said, you know, follow further to our discussion. So um, my assumption is that we, um, we would have had a telephone conversation, but of course, I mean, I don't, I don't recollect that. Do you recollect that you were telling Mr Martin something that he didn't already understand? full well? No. No. Was it your experience by this point that this question which Mr Cho had asked was one which was being asked commonly or with a degree at least of frequency within the UK construction industry? No. Were you aware at any time, and particularly around this time, of manufacturers simply stating an equivalence between Class Nought and Class B without carrying out European testing? No. So you weren't aware, for example, I don't need to show you necessarily the document, but 
BBA, certif well, BBA certificates, uh, which stated in terms that because a product had achieved Class B, it may be regarded as Class naught. No. You didn't know anything about that? No. Can we go please to CLG 1005092? This is uh, another progress report dated 12th of December 2011 now. Uh, and it's on the UK's representation on EU fire standards, which was prepared by the BRE for the department, which had now become the Department for Communities and Local Government. Mm -hmm. And if we go to page two, we can see that the report was uh, uh, prepared by Steve Kelly, uh, sorry, for Steve Kelly, by Dr. Corinne Williams, and it was approved by you Yes. that day, 12th of December 2011. Can we go to page four? On page four, we see FSH 21 reaction to fire tests met on 11th October 2011. Uh, and then if you look at the first bullet point below that, it says this. The issue regarding the withdrawal of BS 476 series of standards is still unresolved within BSI. A number of years ago, it was agreed by FS, FHS 21 and FSH 22 uh, the BS 476 series of standards should, be, should not be withdrawn because they are widely used outside of the UK and Europe, for example, Far East. Based on this, it was agreed with BSI that they would be retained, but it would need to be made very clear in the forward or scope of each standard that they could not be used for CE marking purposes. Frustration was expressed that several years on, this matter remain, still remains unresolved sorry, unsolved, and now there is new danger that the standards will be withdrawn, which will be very detrimental for British industry and the use of BS standards in other parts of the world. Why was the withdrawal of the BS 476 series of standards still unresolved in 2011, some 10 years after their withdrawal was initially considered, and six years after the 2004 meetings? Yeah, I mean, my, my recollection of that is it was a matter that was being discussed within BSI as to how to address this within the context of the Construction Products Directive, etc. I mean, from a very simplistic point of view where, um, you know, the members of FSH 21 sat um, and probably FSH 22, um, I think the frustration that's being expressed there was one that... From our um, perception, it, sim it needed just some simple statement adding into the forward that would just make it clear that um, you know they couldn't be used for CE marking purposes. But there was some um, behind-the-scenes discussions within BSI that became, for whatever reason, very protracted, and um, that's why the matter remained unresolved. It, I mean, it says unresolved or unsolved within BSI. Mm. Why was that not a matter for government, at least in relation to the content of the approved document? Um, sorry, I'm not sure I follow. Well, why wasn't the government at this point looking, to, to, so far as you can assist us with the, the answer, uh, at putting an end date on the transition period, using this as a prompt. Yeah, I, I don't know. What were the factors which were stopping the matter from being resolved within the BSI, do you know? No, I don't know. What was your role in the decision at the time to retain those standards or in advising either the BSI or the department on whether they should be retained? Um, well, as chair, you are there to chair the meeting and to try to achieve consensus around the committee table. Well, so, yes, clearly, uh, that's the role of a chairman. But what, what, what was your part in the actual the substantive decision making about retaining those standards? I mean, for example, did you agree they should be retained, or did you say they shouldn't? Did you have a say um, as chairman? Not particularly, no. I mean, you, you, you facilitate the discussion and you take the views of everybody and then you distill that down into the consensus view. I mean, yeah. as chairman, you don't have the, the, you know, you can't say, well, that's all very nice, thank you very much. I'll, I'll decide 
to do something completely different. No, I understand that. What was your view? Um, I think that there was um, evidence provided that there was a need for these to be retained for use outside of Europe, and I understood that. And what impacted the continued retention of BS 476 standards within the UK have on the decision to retain them? But that, that was a separate matter and a separate discussion. It was not something that was particularly discussed within the Technical Standards Committee. Who had decided at this stage that each BS 476 standard should contain a caveat that they could not be used for CE marketing, m marking purposes? Um, I don't think it had been decided. Who was frustrated, as it says here, that the matter stood unresolved? I think it was the well, the committee in general. Did you go to government over it? Um, well, this was sent to government. This was sent to the department. Yeah, sorry, by which I mean, did you, you, you yourself take it up with either Anthony Bird or Brian Martin? Um, I don't recall I'm, whether I would have discussed this with, with them or not. If there had been the opportunity, potentially I would have done. But, you know, equally, as I say, the, the, the report was such that that would be provided to them and, and it would be clear. Analyzing the last sentence, or last part of the last sentence, it says there's a new danger that the standards will be withdrawn, which will be very detrimental for British industry and the use of BS standards in other parts of the world. Was, was the danger to British industry um, one of re reduction of the possibility of export for use in those parts of the world which continued to use BS 476, Part 6 and 7? That's my understanding, yes. And what about um, intra-UK? Was there a sense that the new, da the new danger posed by the risks of withdrawal might be detrimental for British industry in selling within the United Kingdom? No. That wasn't a, a consideration, or was it? No, I don't believe it was, because, as I said before, the expectation was they were going to be withdrawn, and they were not going to be permitted for use. And by this time, in October 2011, we were very close to having the construction products regulation in place, which, um, you know, it was evident to everybody that um, CE marking would be mandatory from that point on. Now, at this stage, this is now late 2011, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yes, 20, 2012, I'm sorry, this is 2012. Mm. Did this discussion here not prompt a wider discussion between you and the department about the end of the termination period for harmonisation, the end of the, um, the period during which equivalence could be maintained? Um, not specifically, no. Why is that? Um, as I say, the, the context to this is that, in fact, in 2012, the construction product regulation was published and it made CE marking mandatory. So if you wanted to place a product on the market that was covered by um, a harmonised um, European standard, then you had to comply with the requirements of that standard and do the EN um, classification for those products. So the, the route um, for using the BS 476 series was, you know, um, you, you wouldn't be placing your product on the market at that point based on 476 testing. But by now, there had not only been the 2006 amendments to ADB, but the 2010 amendments to ADB. Why was Class Nought still in Diagram 40? Well, I can't comment on that. I, d I don't know. Well, was there a prompted discussion about that question, prompted by this discussion, namely the withdrawal or potential withdrawal of BS 476? Not that I can recollect. And why is that? Why was the connection not made? Well, as I say, I think the context was different in 2012. Was it your view, I'm trying to understand your evidence, that the arrival of the construction products regulation essentially did away with Class Nord? Um, for new products coming onto the market, yes. Right, but what about old products? 
Well, and, and that's where the, gov the government, the department, had to make their policy decision as to how long they wanted um, products that already had classification and were deemed to remain unchanged um, to continue to claim Class O performance for. When you say that's where the government had to make their policy decision, my question is, was there any discussion that you can remember about the government actually making that policy decision and getting on and imposing at long last an, uh, an end to the transition period that had been discussed back in 2002? I don't know. I wasn't involved in any. That's all I can say. I'm sure the government officials would be able to help you with that. I want to ask you about Fire Note 9 now, a different topic. We looked earlier in your evidence at some of the recommendations made by the Select Committee in December, <coughs> December 1999. Uh, and you'll recall, I think, and this is in your statement, that the, the recommendation was that, the, that BR135 should be revised to reflect the types of products and cladding systems then in use and that a large-scale fire test standard should be published by the British Standards Institute. What I've just put to you is paragraph 29 of your, yes. your statement, Dr Smith. Now, just running through the chronology, it's right to think that BR135 was published in its first edition in 1988. Yes. Uh, and in 1999, when the Select Committee made its recommendations, I think Fire Note 9 had already been submitted to the BSI for adoption as a British standard, hadn't it? Um, it may well have been. I, I couldn't uh, confirm that sat here now. I think we have that noted, in fact, in the... Uh, in the Select Committee's recommendations at paragraph 20. Okay. Take that from me at CLG 30 19478, page 9. Do you know when it had been submitted to the BSI? No, I don't. Do you know when it had first been suggested that what had been Fire Note 9 should become a British standard? Uh, no, I don't. Do you know who made that suggestion? No, I don't. Have there been any discussions between the department, the BSI and the BRE before the BRE's large-scale test method was submitted? Um, I don't know. You don't know? You don't know whether there were or there weren't? You, you yeah, weren't no, I, I, no, I wasn't involved. You weren't involved. Who was involved from the BRE about that? Um, well, I don't know. I don't know if those discussions took place. Well, there must have been some discussion, surely, yeah. at least between the BRE and the BSI. Um... I don't know. I mean, it's possible that a discussion took place between the department and BSI, given the imperative that had been placed on it by the um, Parliamentary Select Committee. But that wouldn't necessarily mean that BRE was directly involved in that discussion. In simple terms, what is or was the effect of a test being adopted as a British standard? What does, it, what does that status bring? Um, it's basically a publicly published document that um, is standardised in the way that in, goes through the standardisation process and then that makes it available to <coughs> anybody else to pick it up and use it. It does away with any um, potential issues to do with copyright and, and so on and so forth. So its adoption by the BSI was a eventually as it was, was a positive development? Um, well, it gave it a different status. Hmm. And a positive development because it meant that there was no longer necessarily at least reliance on small-scale testing uh, with all of its disadvantages and defects? Correct. Yes. Do you know what the department's view was at the time about the adoption of Fire Note 9 as a British standard? Was it, was it, did it welcome it or did it oppose it or was it neutral? Do you know? Um, I don't know. Now, what about the BRE? Uh, we've established that the BRE had been privatised in 1997. Did you yourself view the impending adoption of Fire Note 9 as a British standard uh, as a positive development? Um, I think my view would have been, um, yes, that it was a positive development. For the BRE? And in general. And in general. But why for the BRE particularly? Um, well, of course, it meant that, um, well, we were already doing testing in that area, so in that respect, it didn't really make um, a significant difference. But, um, yes, it's a positive development in the sense that it's um, 
opening um, the opportunities up for other laboratories um, to, to, to set up and do the test as well if they wish. And indeed, some, some did. And indeed, to expand the BRE's own testing programme vis-à-vis its clients. Well, insofar as some clients, although not a vast number, were already testing to Fire Note 9, I don't think um, it was going to make a truly dramatic difference to the work that was already ongoing. Do you know what the views of industry were on the publication of BS 8414 Part 1 in 2002? Um, no. Was there any resistance or, or objections to the test methodology in Fire Note 9 becoming a British standard? I don't recall any, but then I might not have been aware of that anyway. Now, you say in your statement, again, it's paragraph 29, that Fire Note 9 was the initial methodology used as the basis for BS 8414. Yes? Yes. Who, who was it who created BS 8414 out of Fire Note 9? Um, well, I, usually what happens is... Um, the document would be submitted and would be considered by the um, committee that, that was set up to deal with the standardisation process, and they would have attached to them an editor, a BSI editor, that would then basically convert it into the standard format um, within the requirements of a British standard. So that kind of editorial process and so on is done by professional editors within BSI. Right. Um, but before that, uh, w was there any development work done on Fire Note 9 to convert it into the document that was then submitted to the BSI for them to edit? Um, I doubt that. I don't know is the answer. No, I don't. And who carried out the uh, consultation? Was there a consultation on that? Uh, yes, there would have been. Mm. And who carried that out? It would be BSI. They have a standardised process that all, all standards go through. And is it right that at least one of the BSI committees considering the test method in 2000 was FSH21? Um, Reaction to fire? Yes. The um, actual work was done by a joint working group of two subcommittees that sat under FSH 21 and FSH 22. So there were the, basically the experts that sat on the subcommittee that did the, the work um, were drawn from the entire membership of FSH 21 and the entire membership of FSH 22. Right. So all it was open to whoever was interested to participate, basically. Right. Now, who, which were these two subcommittees? What were they? What were um, they called? I think it was FSH 21.7, which dealt with um, intermediate and large-scale test methods. And there was a similar analogue committee within FH, FSH 22 as well. Um, but I don't remember the number of that committee. And who was on committee. those committees? Who was on those oh, committees? Oh, gosh. I, I, can't, I can't recall. I think you were a member of FSH 21 at that time, weren't you? Um, in... 2000 well, between 2000 and two thousand between 2000 and 2002 um, probably was a member of 21 uh, 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 was any other BRE person a member of FASH 21 um, I don't recall was any BRE person on either of these subcommittees um, yes yes there would have been right who was that um, so I think FSH 21.7 at the time um, had a representative, Dr. Ken Shaw, from um, BRE. Right. Anybody else? Um, but then when the call would go out for membership, I mean, for the joint working group, um, Dr. Sarah Colwell would have um, been the, the choice for that. Right. For that task. I see. And let's go to um, BSI 50215, please. This is a, a minute uh, of a meeting of the 14th of February, 2000. And we see that from the top right-hand corner of this document. And this is uh, a minute of, or unconfirmed minute of, both of these subcommittees, FSH 217 and 227, 
21.7 being large and intermediate scale tests. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in fact, the meeting itself happened on the 24th of January 2000. But this is the date of the minute, 14th of February. Okay. And there's the list of people who attended. And at the very bottom, three up from the bottom, is your name. Yes? Okay. Yes. And um, we can also see other names. Janet Morell from Warrington. Larry Cody from Eurosol, familiar name. Stephen Ledbetter from the University of Bath, CWCT fame, mm -hmm. uh, and others. Yes. Uh, um, and you can see the various industry groups. Yes. Uh, now, Eurosol, I think, was the UK Mineral Wool Association, wasn't it? Um, yes, I think it was yes. at the time. Now, now, January 2000 was obviously uh, some time ago. Um, do you have any recollection of this meeting? Um, no, not until you've um, put those minutes up. Um, obviously, I would guess this was the first meeting. Um, and I also note that it's being chaired by Tony Edwards, who was actually DETR at the time. Yes. Yes, thank you. Now, let's see if the minutes can assist your recollection. Can we go, please, to page two and look at the heading two test method? Uh, and underneath it, that underneath that it says this. The chairman explained that the FRS test method was referred to in the revised ADB, which was why DETR had requested that it should be converted into a British standard. The first report of the House of Commons Environment, Transport and Regional Affairs Subcommittee had recommended compliance with this test method. The secretary added that she had received correspondence from the House of Commons subcommittee inquiring about the progress of the document. Now, just putting that in its context, of course, this is a January meeting, 2000, and the report of the select committee had come out five or so weeks before that on the 14th of December, mm -hmm. 1999. So that's where we are in the chronology. And if we go then down to page three, paragraph 2.1, um, you can see comments on the DPC. Dr. Towler introduced the comments from Chiltern International Fire, which had suggested that curtain walling should be deleted from the scope of the BRE test and that it should be clearly stated that the test only applied to residential buildings. He had also suggested that the concept of mechanical response should be deleted. Mr. Morris said that the scope should cover facades and not external cladding systems. Mr. Bromley said that the test would not apply to glazed systems as glazing industry looked at fire resistance from inside out. Mr. Morris explained that the BRE test covered external fire spread which could start from the inside or the outside. It was not a fire resistance test. Mr. Bromley expressed his concern that if all systems were required to be tested to the new BS, then a whole industry could disappear. Mr. Edwards explained that alternative methods were available at present for the systems not covered by the BRE test. However, the House of Commons subcommittee had recommended a single method for all types and that it should be a standalone document. Now, Dr. Towler, he, I think, was chairman of FSH 22, wasn't he? Um, he was at some point, but I'm not sure he was at that point. But if we go back to page one of the document, I think it tells us that. OK. Um, He was the chairman of the subcommittee, FSH 22 slash 7. Uh, thank you. Yes, you're yeah. quite right. Um, and then if we, it, it, you also see from the list of those present that Mr. Bromley was from the Association of Fire Resistant Glass and Glazed Systems, yes? Yes. Who was Mr. Morris? Was that Tony Morris? Um, yes, I believe so. I can't see another Mr. Morris, so yes, it would be. Uh, Yes, he's, he's two names above yours, W.A. Yes. Morris, Fire Research yes. Station. Do you, re do you recall the discussion now? No, I don't. Do you recall the concern expressed by Mr. Bromley that if all systems were required to be tested to the new BS, then a whole industry could disappear, as I've read to you? Um, I don't recall that. I mean, I do, do recall there being some um, issues around glazing and glazed systems. You do? Yes. Did you understand him, and I know it's a long time ago, but do you understand him to be referring to the glazing industry or the cladding industry more generally? 
we would, well, I would have expected him to be referring to the glazing industry because right. that's the sector that he was representing. Yes. As far as you were, were aware and can recall, was that particular concern expressed by others from other segments of the industry? I don't recall that. I don't. No. So was Mr. <coughs> Bromley alone in his concern? Um, well, I can only go by what the minutes are saying here, yes. and I would have thought if others had expressed concerns around other types of systems, then that would have been um, recorded. Now, as I say, it's a long time ago, but do you recall having at least the impression that there were some in the facades industry who were resistant to the concept of full-scale fire testing being made as a, a requirement or a sole requirement? Um, it appears so, yes. Yes. It appears so, certainly, from this, but do you have yes. a recollection yourself of that, um, even an impressionistic one? Not, I wasn't particularly aware of it. Right. Not, not within the UK scenario. Uh, I mean, just, just help me with this. My understanding was that uh, <coughs> these discussions were about um, a test method that eventually became BS8414. Yes. It's just a method. Yes. So why are people getting excited about whether it should be made mandatory for all uh, cladding systems. That would be a matter for the government to decide, not yes. for the BSI to decide, surely. Yeah, absolutely. But I guess they were directed predominantly at the chairman of the committee, who, of course, was a representative of DETR. Mm. Yes, all right. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Would we be right in reading Mr. Bromley's concerns as based on the commercial industries of his sector of the industry? Yes, he would be, be, be representing their interests. Yes. yes. Was there any discussion that you can recall, either during this meeting or, or any other time, about the balance of priorities between industry's commercial interests in this respect and public safety? No. It didn't come up at all? Not that, it, not, not that I was party to, no. Can we then go down to page four of the minutes? And the first line on that page, please. And it says there, uh, the issue where the curtain warning should be deleted from the scope was discussed, but no agreement was reached. D do you know or remember how that question came to be resolved? Not specifically. Um, I suspect um, Kevin Towler, through the work that he was doing with the glazing industry and curtain walling, the development of the fire resistance tests, um, would have um, contributed to that discussion. If we move down page four, we can see in the next paragraph it says this. The question was raised whether all new systems would have to be tested to the new BS. The chairman explained that if the new BS proved to be a burden to industry, then the situation would be reviewed. He suggested that the BRE document should be published as a BS in its current state and then submitted to TC127 for development into an EN. Do you know who it was at the meeting who raised that question? No, I don't. Because it's not answered in the minutes. Do you know whether an answer was given? No, I don't. Was there an answer? at that time, January 2000? Um, I don't know. Did you know at that stage whether or not testing to full scale would become a requirement? Um, I don't recall. Do you remember what your reaction was to the comment that the situation would be reviewed if the new British standard test proved to be a burden to industry, as it says? I don't recall. You don't recall that? No. What would burden to industry be? Cost? Presumably. I presume that would be what um, Mr. Edwards was talking about. Did you, did you ask, did you investigate what this involved? Um, not specifically, no. I mean, it may have been clearer within the context of the meeting, but the, you know, the minutes are just not clear on that particular point. But I, I don't recall this. As you said earlier, it's a very long time ago. Right. Um, and you said, I think before, but just humour me, answer it again. Is it right that s safety wasn't discussed as a balancing factor to be considered alongside 
for the various industry segments' commercial interests? Um, not explicitly, because the task was to develop the test methodology and produce that as the British standard. And I think, as I alluded to earlier, the um, matters around how the tools in the toolbox are used is dealt with elsewhere. It's not dealt with within the British standard, technical standards area. Uh, in, in light of that, and perhaps anyway, let's turn to BR135, and um, let's just see, see if we can be clear about this. So BSA414 parts 1 and 2 are test methodologies, aren't they? Yes, they are. Uh, and BRE135, BR135 contains the performance criteria against which a test carried out to BS4814 is assessed, yes? Correct. Yes. Now, wh why is that? Um, by which I mean, why did BR135 not itself become a British standard in the same way that Fire Note 9 did? Um, I don't recollect the sort of background to that, other than, of course, the contract that was issued that required us to, to do that. So the contract that we spoke about, I think it was CC, um, was it 1924, the contract we discussed yesterday, um, Part of that was to develop the criteria within BR135. Mm. But I, I don't know what the prelude to that was mm. in terms of why that route was decided. Did you ever take it on yourself to investigate why it was that the test methodology became st standardised through the BSI, but the criteria by which it would be assessed did not? Um, not at the time, no. Any t at any time? Um, well, I mean, latterly, um, so by that I mean probably what, a year or, well, more than a year ago now, um, probably 18 months, two years ago, um, I approached BSI um, and the department to say that, in my view, it did need to be um, adopted and, um, you know, taken over by BSI. But why not? Then, back in 2002 or well, three, it was published. Yeah, I, I don't recollect. I mean, as I, as I said, I mean, the contract had already been issued in terms of the tender document and discussions would have taken place between others, not me, um, as to why that was the approach that wanted to be adopted and followed. Um, and the tender document was what? A tender document for the contract for the production of BR 135? Yes, yes. Yeah. Did you have any role to play in that? No. Right. Did you see the contract before it went out? No. Who was involved in that um, from the BRE's side? Well, it would have been um, Peter Field as the um, framework manager, and I suspect Tony Morris as the um, lead. Um, researcher in that area. But you don't know, you can't offer us a reason sitting there now why it was that BR135 did not, as BS8414 had, became a, become a standard. No, I don't know what the uh, precursor to that was, no. Um, now, the process of reviewing BR135, which had originally been published in 1988, came about, I think, is this right, as a direct result of the 1999 Select Committee recommendation that, we, that we've looked at? Uh, that's my understanding. And that recommendation, I think, was that BR135 should reflect the types of products and cladding systems then in use. That's, that's what you say in your statement. Yes, that's yes. my understanding. And that's paragraph 29. Was, was the purpose of the survey, the literature review, and the 2001 testing programme, CC 1924, um, to inform uh, what became BR135? Um, that's my understanding, yes. Uh, is it right that the work on drafting the new second edition of BR135, eventually published in 2003, was carried out by Brian Martin and Sarah Colwell? That's my understanding, yes. They, in fact, were the authors? Authors, yes. Now, uh, Brian Martin was still at the BRE at this time, wasn't he? Um, yes. He, he was, in fact, yes, was there, I, I think, so. until 2008. Right, yes. Um, what was his role at that time within the BRE? Um, I think we touched on this previously. Um, basically, I think Brian was recruited by um, other colleagues of mine 
to, because of his building control background, and to um, basically provide the real world interpretation of the application of the building regulations and the approved documents. So he was a building control professional by training and the person that had been fulfilling that role was um, approaching retirement. So I think there was a, probably a period of overlap between Brian and his predecessor, um, at which point he then took on, took on that, that role. Were you his line manager? No. Who was? Um, back in 2002, I don't know for certain, but um, Brian actually worked within um, a different centre to my centre. So his centre head would have been Nigel Smithies. Now, whether Nigel Smithies was his direct line manager, I'm not sure. There may have been somebody you know, between, between him. Did anybody supervise their work on the revisions to BR 135 within the second edition? Um, well, yes, the, the, their line manager, his line manager, would have done so. And um, obviously Nigel Smithies was also, um, would have also played his role as well. Right. Uh, uh, how would you describe your own knowledge of the contents of the first edition of BR 135, the 1988 version, at the time? Um, Were you very familiar with it? Not very familiar with it, no. Right. Um, now, Sarah Colwell, in her statement, says, I'll just show this to you, this is at BRE 307571, page 30. Paragraph 192. She says, as part of the development of the second edition, Brian Martin and I, together with MHCLG, agreed that the first edition could be used as, the suit as a suitable basis for the second edition. Um, first, we know that Sarah Colwell was involved in creating that second edition and indeed was one of the authors. Who supervised her work um, in that respect? So, I mean, in relation to the cladding work up until his retirement, that was Tony Morris. Um, and obviously in relation to the contribution to the parliamentary um, select committee, that would have been um, Peter Field. Um, and then beyond that, um, I started to take more of a, a, su uh, a sort of line management role and um, oversight role in terms of her work. At what point? From, from that point onwards. I think it was probably at the time of the um, contract, which we've already reviewed, I think yesterday, the CC 1924. Um, contract being awarded. Right. So that's, I think that's 2000. Um, something like that, yeah. So I, from that time until publication, you were supervising Sarah Colwell's work on BR 135, were you? Um, well, uh, amongst others. I mean, if she wanted to go and talk to somebody else about the content of it and, and you know, discuss it, then clearly she would have done. So, you know, if it was Tony Morris or um, Peter Field or Richard Reed, then, you know, that... Yeah. That, that clearly would have happened. But yes, yeah. if you'd wanted to. Yes. But my question was, were you supervising Sarah Colwell's work on BR135? Whoever else she talked to, were you the one with responsibility for supervising her work on BR135 between 2000 or so and 2003? Yeah, to, to a point. I mean, I would not be, um, as I said previously, you wouldn't, I would not be repeating all of the work that they were undertaking um, the role of the supervisor is to ensure that they are um, at least following the right um, protocols and procedures and to be there again um, to discuss things if and when there is a need to do so. But by that time, I mean, Sarah was one of um, the, the leading experts in, in BRE on this particular subject area. So. In, in, in brief, she knew a lot more about cladding, cladding testing and cladding systems than, than I did. Were you involved in the discussions and the agreement to use the first edition, the 1988 edition, as the basis for the second edition? No, I wasn't. 
Do you know whether the department, or who it was from the department who was involved in that decision? No, I don't. Do you know what factors were considered when assessing whether the first edition of BR 135 1988 could be used as a suitable basis for the second edition? No, I don't. Did you agree at the time that it was a suitable basis? No, I don't recall having had that discussion at all. You did know it was a basis, though, didn't you, given that you were supervising Sarah Colwell's work at the very least? Um, Potentially, but um, I'll say I wasn't involved in this detailed discussion. No, but you were involved in supervising her work, as you told us. Mm. Did you have a view at the time about whether it was suitable to use the 1988 edition as the basis I, for the 2003 edition? I don't recall. Right. Let's um, go up to paragraph 190. She says there, Brian Martin and I conducted the review of the first edition as part of developing the second edition. Did you, con did you contribute in any way to that review? Uh, no, I don't believe I did. Did you discuss the conclusions of that review with Brian Martin or Sarah Colwell? Um, potentially, if they were producing um, progress reports or, or you know, um, outputs during the course of that, then I would have seen those. Right. Um, were there progress reports or outputs during the course of that? I don't recall. Do you recall seeing any? I, I can't remember. I, I right. don't recall. Did you play any part in checking the draft second edition before it was published against the 1988 edition? Um, I played a role in reviewing um, the second edition, as indeed a number of other people would have done as well. Did you play any part in deciding which parts of the 1988 edition should be retained and which parts discarded in the forthcoming second um, edition? I would always have had the opportunity to comment and to question or to query um, content. Yes, did you, of course. did you take the opportunity and actually ask... I don't recall. ...or, or interrogate the, dis the discards? Yeah, no, or, I, I, I don't recall. I mean, I'd have to see um, versions with comments on them to, to right. understand to understand that today, sat here now. Yes, let's look at the 1988 first edition, BRE 401077. Now, there's the first page of it. You can see the identity yes. of the authors there. Uh, and if we go, please, to page four, uh, it, it, what I wanted to show you, in fact, can we just pan out, please, and I can show you the whole of page four, and then we can focus back in on regulatory aspects. That's the context under the introduction, and you can see the various walls mm -hmm. uh, and wall systems. And then under regulatory aspects, if we have that blown up now, please, it says this. Control over the external surface of walls of buildings, particularly those of multi-storey flats, to avoid ignition and flame spread which might endanger the lives of residents above by breaking down effective compartmentation. And, and there's an asterisk there. And if you look below, can we scroll down a little bit, please? I want to show you what the asterisk says. Compartmentation implies the confining of a fire to a given space by the provision of fire-resisting walls and floors. Mm -hmm. And if we go back to the text, I think you can see it. Compartmentation is currently controlled by reference to tests specified in BS 476 parts 6 and 7. However, these tests only provide information on surface fire behaviour, the overall fire performance of a ventilated cladding system or insulated assembly incorporating independently supported weathering finishes and complicated reveal details can only be investigated under actual fire conditions on a full-scale building facade. Now, it was, is this right? It was still the case in 2000 that those matters were still controlled by reference to BS 476 Part 6 and 7 tests. Um, that's my understanding. Mm. <coughs> and when I say those matters, I mean control yes. over the external surface of walls yes. and buildings, to be clear, yes. Uh, and in 2003, was that still the case? Um, yes. Yes. So does it follow, then, that by 2003, to the best of your knowledge, a decision had been taken not to follow the Select Committee's recommendation to substitute the full-scale test diagram in di for Diagram 40, but instead to provide for a full system test as an alternative option? Um, 
when I'm sorry, I can't remember when the reference to the full scale method went into the approved document. It went in in July 2000. Right. So obviously it was an option at that point, um, and the British Standard Part 1, I think, was published in 2002. So it wouldn't have been possible to have referred to that until, until after 2002. No. Uh, uh, and I think we can take it then that, or that, that, that by this stage, by the time of publication of the second edition... Uh, uh, is this right, that a decision had been taken not to follow the Select Committee's recommendation to replace Diagram 40 and the reference to Class 0 with the, alternate, with, with the full-scale test um, as the route to compliance? Yeah, I don't know. You don't know. Now, take it from me that this paragraph, under regulatory aspects, does not appear, and nor does anything similar to it appear, in the 2003 second edition of BR 135, do you know why that was? No, I don't. Do you know who would have decided to remove it? No, I don't. Was it a matter you noticed at the time? Um, I don't recall. Was it a matter you discussed with Sarah Colwell or Brian Martin at the time? I don't recall that. Do you know, have you any clue about why this section, which refers to the limitations of testing to BS 476 Part 6 and 7, in accordance with what, what you've told us as your own opinions, um, was omitted from the second edition. No, I don't. Was it not to draw attention? Was it so as not to draw attention to those limitations? Um, I think that's unlikely. It may have been um, associated with the expectation that those parts were going to disappear. Do you know? Or but you no, know? I don't. You don't no. know. Now, the second edition of BR 135 was also the subject of consultation, wasn't it? Yes. And Sarah Colwell tells us in her statement, it's paragraph 197 at page 32, but we don't need to see it, is that she and Brian Martin together managed that process and addressed the feedback that was received. Is, is that correct? Uh, yes, I believe so. Did you yourself have, have any involvement in the consultation process? Um, I wouldn't have been involved in um, the questionnaires and the collation of the comments. Um, I may have been involved in um, reviewing the comments as part of a, a panel. Who was on the panel? Um, I, I don't recall. Was it a BRE panel or did the panel have government on it? Um, no, I don't know. Did, did you read any of the consultation responses or advise on how they should be addressed? Um, I may have been asked for my view, my opinion. If they weren't obvious, I mean, if they are just an editorial correction, of course, there would be no need to, to discuss. But it's possible that if they were a bit more meaty than that, then there may have been a discussion around them. So they would fall into various categories, basically. Some would be, um, I say, editorial, and then some would be more um, discussive. Right. I mean, given that this was not going to be a BSI document, but just a BRE publication, did the BRE alone run the consultation? Um, in the sense that, I mean, it wouldn't have gone out via BSI, if that's what you're no, asking. Exactly. No, exactly. So did the, no. B, did the BRE alone mm -hmm. run the consultation? Um, well, probably with input and... Um, assistance from the department because anything that you do in that regard you have to get their agreement if you go out to survey or to consult but given on the behalf on, on their behalf basically <clears throat> well were you consulting people on behalf of the department um yes insofar as the contract was one with the department to draft the second edition of br 135 what role did the department play in the consultation? Um, they would have been aware of it. They would have potentially contributed to, um, or had the opportunity to contribute and to um, consider the comments and the feedback, if you know, if it was appropriate. I mean, we wouldn't, as I say, we wouldn't worry them with um, editorial corrections. And following consultation. <clears throat> Who had final say or final sign-off in relation to the content of the second edition as published? Um, that would probably have been the managing director of um, the BRE fire and security team. And who was that? 
Um, this was in about 2003. Yes. Um, it would either have been Dr. Jeremy Hodge or Dr. Farshad Alamdari. Did the consultation process, as best you can recall it, reveal concerns or resistance on the part of industry? Um, I don't recollect anything but as I'm sat here today. Let me take you to one particular consultation <coughs> response then uh, on this draft edition. This is at BRE 304231. It's a letter to Sarah Coyle, Dr. Sarah Colwell from the CWCT, Alan Keeler, author from the University of Bath, dated the 15th of August 2002. Uh, and uh, in the first line, he says, Dr. Ledbetter has asked me to respond to your letter concerning the above. Now, have you seen this letter before? Um, well, that looks like my writing down the left-hand side. Well, I was so, going to ask you that. Yes. <laughs> so you saw this at the time? Well. Clearly? Yes. Yes, okay. Now, um, do you know what Alan Keeler's role was at the time? No. Was he somebody you, you, knew, you knew professionally? No. What about Dr. Ledbetter? No. Well, we saw, I think, that he was a member of the joint BSI committee considering the draft of BSA 414. Yes. Did, were you not familiar with him? Well, no, not particularly, no. Right. I mean, yeah. Let's look at the second paragraph. It says this. Ventilated rain screens are a cost-effective form of construction used widely throughout Europe. The generic data supporting the revision of BR135 show that all the rain screen systems tested fail to meet the test criteria. We are concerned that use of the proposed test will lead to the abandonment of this method of construction without any guarantee that alternative forms of construction are available, particularly for multi-storey buildings where weight is an important consideration. If this occurs, there could be economic consequences for the building industry and the UK as a whole. It was emphasised at the outset of the work of the BSI committee that it is necessary to take account of the needs of industry and use of energy in buildings. Is that right? H had it been emphasised at the outset of the work of the BSI committee that it was necessary to take account of needs of industry? Um, well, all, all I can recollect is the notes that you showed earlier, so, um, and the, the points that um, Tony Edward, Edwards made at that, th that were recorded at, at that meeting. Mr Bromley, I think, as well. Yes. Yes. And on the left-hand side of the letter, we can see what I think you've now identified as your handwritten comment, which reads, P28, revised text to make clear that appropriate fire barriers could improve performance. Now, we've already seen that of the ventilated systems <coughs> tested in the previous year, you'll recall the TC 1924 testing program mm -hmm. in, in 2001, four of the five systems tested at full scale had no fire barriers, mm -hmm. and all four failed. Yes. The fifth system tested did incorporate fire barriers and also failed, didn't it? Uh, yes. Yeah. And in the light of that, on what basis was it considered that a revision, a revision to the text to the effect that appropriate fire barriers could improve performance should be made? I don't know the context to that statement. It doesn't appear to relate to the content of this um, letter. So... Um Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a bit puzzled as to why that is um, written in the context of this letter. Well, it, there's, an, there's a P28 and an arrow. Presumably P28 is the area in the draft which you wanted to have revised, yes? Well, that, that will refer to page 28. I of mean, the, the draft? Yes, of, of whatever the document was that went out for consultation, I it, guess. Yes. Uh, and as an arrow pointing to the sentence, rain screen systems no, failed to meet no, the test criteria. I, I don't think that is pointing to that particular right. point. I mean, I often use an arrow for the continuation. I mean, that's... That's how you do it? Yes, All I right. do. But it, it's right, isn't it, that, that in fact, your statement there, appropriate fire barriers could improve performance, wasn't based on any evidential data from the experimental test programme uh, carried out the previous year, was it? Um... Not that in isolation, but as I've said earlier in, in my evidence, 
I mean, there was a growing body of information. We already had the information that had been carried out in the previous work as well. But so it was, you know, it was a general um, view that properly designed fire barriers could potentially improve performance. What is the body of information that you're referring to there? The work that um, Dr Connolly had done previously. But, but I thought Dr Connolly had said that the, the fire barriers made no difference, or negligible difference. No, I mean, we, we, we had evidence that they were potentially making a difference, and they were required anyway to be incorporated within the systems um, at the lines of compartmentation. Well, that, that's certainly the case, isn't it? Mm. Because that is what approved document B yes. said and had said for a long time before that. But you had more recent test evidence, 14 tests, w which would not support your statement here. And tests, moreover, done for the very purpose of research, which would back up BR135 in this edition, yes? Well, as, as I say, my, my understanding and my view at the time, and it remains to date, that fire barriers can improve the performance of the system. But your evidence, I'm putting to you that the empirical basis for that statement was unreliable, not complete, out of date, and superseded well, it, it by the tests that you've done for the been, specific purpose. Okay. I mean, it might not have been um, as expansive and as extensive as we would have liked, but there was evidence available, otherwise we would not be saying that. Was this suggestion a sop to industry? <coughs> no, because if people wanted to um, achieve classification to BR135, they clearly had to test to the BS8414 and achieve the classification. So, I mean, it's not, it's not telling people it's not a sop to industry in the sense that it's giving them an easy, an easy ride or saying you don't need to test these, just do that. It, 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 it's just, I, I don't understand what you mean, a sop to industry really in this context. Well, it's an encouragement, isn't it? That, that, that if you didn't pass, then fire barriers might help. An encouragement. Well, I mean, you should be incorporating fire barriers anyway, as we've just established, so... Let's move to the edition itself. Um, I'm going to assume, is this right, or is it fair, that you were, at the time, familiar with BR135 in its second edition? At which time? 2003. Um, well, I would have seen it in its draft, yes. Yeah. Uh, now, let's go to that document. It's a BRE 405554. We need page two for the first page. There it is. And if we go to the second page, you can see the authors, Sarah Colwell and Brian Martin. Can we go, please, to page 22? And the heading on page 22 is Performance Criteria and Classification Method. You see that? Yes. And uh, in the first indent, just above the three bullet points, it says... The performance of the system under investigation is evaluated against three criteria, external fire spread, internal fire spread, mechanical performance. Now, I think it's right that those criteria match those that we'd seen in Fire Note 3. You remember that? Um, yes. I, I mean, so I can show that to you if you like. Yes, it, no, I, I, let's take that as well. For our purposes, it's, the, yes. it's BRE 405868, page 9, paragraph 10.1. Um, but if we look at page 23 you can see the failure criteria set out. Uh, and if we have them expanded a little bit, please. You can see there are criteria for external fire spread, which is um, adjudged if an external thermocouple at level two exceeds 600 degrees for a period of at least 30 seconds or more within 15 minutes of the start of the test. Internal fire spread, and you have failure if an internal thermocouple at level two exceeds 600 degrees centigrade for 30 seconds or more within 15 minutes of the start of the test. And then mechanical performance. No failure criteria have been set for mechanical performance. However, details of any system collapse, spalling, delamination or flaming debris should be included in the test report. 
The nature of the mechanical failure should be considered as part of the overall risk assessment when specifying the system. See, for example, figure A7, and then there's a, a, uh, an image below that after the test. Now, before we look at some questions about failure criteria, um, what was the purpose, in general terms, of BR135? And my question is directed at, at the second and then the third editions in 2013. What was it for? Um, for passing, for, for giving a pass-fail, um, pass-fail criteria for um, the associated with the BS eight four one four test measurements. What what risks was it addressing? Um, external fire spread up the outside of a building, spread of the fire back within the system that could potentially then also spread vertically. And um, obviously the, the mechanical performance one is looking at um, materials falling off of the wall. So that's looking at um, the potential for, I mean, you wouldn't want that happening over an escape route, for example. And what was the objective of a large scale test done under 8414? To these criteria? Um, what was the objective of the test? Mm. Well, what was the objective of the criteria? Um, to manage the risk. C can we agree against those rather general answers that BR135 and the large scale testing to which it refers are addressing a generic risk? of flame spread across the surface of the external wall of a, a building uh, and, and through cavities, but leaves it to the competent professional to assess the nature and the acceptability of the risk of flame spread in any particular fire safety strategy? Um, well, it does within the context of mechanical performance but obviously the external fire spread and internal fire spread criteria, as I understand them anyway, are pass-fails. If you don't satisfy that, then it's, it's a fail, and you won't get a BR135 classification. And a failure means what? Um, that you've exceeded the temperature criteria. Yeah, clearly. Well, what, what, what's the, uh, in lay terms, what does that mean to the man in the street? Um, Okay, so it's time time bound, and what you're doing is you're measuring the advancement of the temperature, either up uh, up the outside or within within the the, the, the system, um, and saying that you cannot spread faster than um, the time bound criteria in terms of the flame spread. Can you explain why these particular performance criteria we see under external fire spread and internal fire spread were chosen? I don't know the full background to that, no. Do you know what those performance criteria represented or were deemed to represent? Um, no, I don't. You don't know. Why 600 degrees, for example, or why 30 seconds? You don't know? Um, well, I think the 30 seconds is so that you go beyond the point of just an intermittent flash of flame. I mean, that would be my, my view on that. Um, you want, you know, something, the flame to be there for a period of time. Um, the, the temperature, no, I don't know specifically why 600 degrees was chosen. Um, but as you said, that dated back to the earlier versions of um, the fire notes. And what's the rationale behind the failure criteria for external and internal fire spread? 630 seconds, 15 minutes. What, what, what's, the, what's the rationale? Yeah, I, I don't fully know. I mean, it's been spoken about anecdotally that 15 minutes was associated with um, the fire brigade attendance times, but I don't know whether that is um, right. correct or not. Yeah, just to, how could you... Oversee Dr. Colwell's work to, to the limits you described and oversee the consultation process without 
knowing what the performance criteria are supposed to represent or what their rationale is? How could uh, you do that? Well, it was on the basis of um, discussions that were taking place with other BRE members of staff that had led to this. And I had no reason to believe that the criteria that they had already um, largely established were, were not performing the function that had been agreed. And there had been, as I say, extensive work and extensive consultation that had gone on to this point. Yes. And I was not an expert in this particular subject area. But given that it came across your desk, did you not think, just to ask the basic questions, well, just help me. Why 600 degrees? Why 30 seconds? Why 50 minutes? What's it doing? Just, just, just educate me. Why didn't you ask Brian Martin or Sarah Colwell to do that so that you could understand what was being published? Well, I'm, I, I don't recall the, the nature of the specific discussions that took place at the time, but I'm sure there was some discussion around some of these points. But if there had been, you would understand it and be able to answer my question. Well, and that, well, that's what I'm trying to explain to you, that basically, anecdotally, my understanding is that 15 minutes comes from the fire brigade attendants, um, but I've never seen that written down as such, um, and that the uh, period of 30 seconds relates to, you know, the, the duration of the flaming. Can I, can I just ask, do you happen to know whether the criteria in the first edition were actively reviewed for the purposes of drafting the second edition. Um, because time had passed and yes. people's understanding might right. have changed and the criteria perhaps were due for reconsideration. Yeah, I don't think there were any criteria in the first edition of BR 135. I think the criteria appeared in Fire Note 3. Well, that's even older. Or Fire Note 9. I, uh, well, same, yes, same yes. question. Yeah, um, and I'm sure there was a review um, and a discussion, um, I'd say, with Tony Morris and people like that about where they had come from and, and why they were chosen. And, I mean, Sarah, in providing that continuity through, through the work, um, you know, would have had those discussions. Do you know why the pass-fail criteria in BR 135, in this and indeed the next edition later, 10 years on, weren't specifically and expressly linked to the uh, issues addressed in the main, bo uh, the main body of the document, which I haven't shown you, but I'm assuming you're familiar with, or the requirements of the building regulations and approved document B? Um, what you mean in terms of repeating text and, and so on? Um, well, again, this is in effect a classification document in the same way that I suppose you could argue um, the EN 13501 series are classification documents. And again, they, they are tools. Um, it's for others to define the context within which those tools are used. Yeah. So you'd expect ADB to pass comment or, you know, if they wish to change these or they, they wish to refer to them in a different way, then that is up to ADB to do so. You wouldn't expect to find all of that provided for in BR135 itself. No, that's not really my question. Let me, let me try it slightly differently. Um, did you understand at the time that these criteria here on the screen which would result in a pass or a fail, um, were designed to test uh, whether uh, the um, surface of an external wall in the full system as tested would adequately resist the spread of fire over the surface of the walls in accordance with the functional requirement B41. That was my understanding as to what it was intended to be guiding and assisting. Right, now, yes. on what basis did you have that understanding? Based on discussions that I would have had with colleagues. Did you ask your colleagues, what is it that tells me that 600 degrees is the limit for adequacy, as um, opposed to 500 degrees? Okay, so, I mean, when you look at the body of evidence, and 
I mean, I'm, I don't recall this precise discussion, um, but they looked at lots, the, the, the basic, the outputs from the tests that were carried out and were looking to specify the criteria that would ensure that products that you didn't want to pass didn't pass, and those that um, should have passed did pass. But in order to do that, you would need to know what adequacy meant, yes? Yes, but then that would have been down to the discussion with um, the department and the discussions that would have gone on alongside that. And so an agreement in terms of the interpretation of adequacy would have been informed by the department. You see, in 1992, which of course postdated the first edition, the word adequate wasn't present in the functional requirement. It came yes. in in 2000, mm. as we saw. Yes. Given that change, did you not think, or did anybody at the BRE not think, under the contract, to go to government and say, well, we're designing you a full-scale test, but we need to know what you understand or propose by the word adequate in the functional requirement so that we can design a test that meets your parameters. Did you do that? I personally didn't do that. Did anybody at the BRE do that? Well, I find it difficult to... Um to consider that that would not have taken place because the department were fully behind this and it would have been implicit, if not explicit, in, in, in the context of the discussions that would have taken place. Well, I, I, I think most people would agree with you that it's difficult to consider that that would not have taken place. My question is, did it take place? I can't answer that. And I, who can? I don't know. Um, did you not... Brian, Brian Martin may be able to answer that. Right. Okay, you might. But, but when you were uh, conducting your supervision of this work and the consultation process itself, did you not yourself ask the question, either of Brian Martin or of Sarah Colwell or of Anthony Bird, who was in the department, w what are, let me know, so I can understand whether this document is fit for purpose, what are the criteria representing adequacy from the department's perspective? No, I don't recall asking that. Is it your understanding that during an 8414 test, a fire directly capable of penetrating the fire compartment above uh, could take hold on the facade and then spread vertically, but the system being tested could still pass the test if the temperatures didn't reach a certain level, namely 600 degrees? Um... So you're saying the fire could spread, say, three storeys, but without the temperature reaching 600? Yes. That's not possible. That's not possible. So you, you say, is this right? You say, do you, and thought at the time, that these criteria, if uh, met, all of them met, um, meant that there was no challenge to the underlying assumptions inherent in a stay-put policy in a high-rise building? Um, I wouldn't have considered these within that context. I mean, that would have been for others to have considered. I was not a building designer and have never been involved in building design. You, you know, other people would be considering this. But isn't the whole point of this test to make sure that... Um, whatever fire takes hold in a cladding system, it doesn't undermine the fundamental assumptions inherent in a stay-put policy in place in a high-rise residential building. Well, I say that's for others to consider. Do you know why it is that this, and indeed the third edition ten years later, focus almost entirely on the threat of fire propagation through cavities and say very little about the potential for flame spread through or on the external cladding system itself? Um, I don't think it focuses entirely on fire spread through cavities. It deals with um, externally rendered systems also, and there are no cavities in many of the externally rendered systems. Well, I may be wrong about this, and I can be corrected, but the only direct reference to the potential for flame spread through the panels themselves comprising the outer skin of a high-rise building is in the 2013 edition 
at paragraph 6.4.1, and we can look at that if you want to. But should we look at that? Um, I don't recall it without... You don't recall. All right. So. right. Do you know how... If, if we're right about that, and on the assumption that we're right about that, do you know how it can be justified, given what the BRE knew about the circumstances of the fire and the fire spread at Naseley Heights in 1991, or at Garnock, uh, or at the edge in Salford in 2005? Sorry, could you ask the question again? Yes, do you know why it was that the focus was not on fires in cladding systems, put it simply, cladding systems on fire, given what the BRE knew by this time, 2003, about the fire at Knowsley in 1991 and the fire at Garnet Court in Irvine in 1999? Well, my understanding is it does address fires in cladding systems. Do you know why there's no methodology or list of considerations for determining or assessing the risk posed by external panels. For example, class naught external panels. Insofar as, what, as an individual element? Yes. That's not the objective of BS 8414, to look at the individual elements within the cladding system. It's to look at the entire makeup of the cladding system of the external wall. There's no attempt in here, is there, to measure flame velocity uh, or heating or flame or heating length as part of the large-scale testing method, is there? Um, well, I would disagree with that to some degree. Um, the very fact that you are using a consistent temperature measurement, as in 600 degrees C, and you are um, controlling it, bounding it, um, in terms of time, you are, in effect, okay, you're, you're not declaring a flame spread velocity, but you are setting a parameter beyond which flame, the, the velocity of flame spread is not acceptable. What useful information for a fire engineer assessing the performance of an external wall system in, the, in, in terms of external fire spread would an 8414 test Provide. Okay, so I don't think you'll find really any of the test standards or test methods that are used in terms of classifying products that are designed to give engineering data that can be used in calculation methods. So I think you're talking about different things. If, as a fire engineer, you want to do an engineering analysis, then these might not be the right tools for you. Do you know why there is no classification system or failure criteria given at all in relation to the, the third performance requirement, mechanical performance? I don't know for certain, no. You don't. Was consideration ever given to having openings as part of an 8414 test so that you could least, at least make visual observations of the propensity of the particular structure under test to, to have compartmentation failure? Um, what you mean having windows that look through yeah. the cladding system? For example. Um, I don't know whether consideration was given to that. That, that may have been explored in the sort of early, early um, experiments that were done. Um, I mean, there's always been a debate, and that debate is going on now within Europe as well, as to to what extent you want to put openings into these types of systems because you then run into the um, discussion as to any failure that occurs around those openings. Is that really a failure of the cladding system or is it a failure of the system that you've used to close the, the, the opening that you've introduced into the cladding system? So it, is it a real test of, of what you're trying to do? And, and there's, there's an ongoing debate around that, that Even, it, as we speak now. Right. How would an 8414 test provide you with any information, for example, about the capacity of aluminium successfully uh, to, to, to um, cover an, an ACM panel? Um, by which I mean, how, how would this kind of test give you any information about how an ACM panel with a PE core would perform? In the sense that if it had been tested, you mean, if, if, as if it had part, been part of the system? Of the yes. Um, well, it would have um, rapidly spread fire, as we've seen since 
um, we did the um, seven tests for DCLG mm. in 2017. How, how, yes, well, that may be the answer. I mean, how does this test tell you how an aluminium, an ACM panel with a PE core, would perform in relation to its aluminium? In other words, what its aluminium facing would do? Well, it won't tell you in isolation, but it's telling you as part of the system in which it's incorporated. But without p mechanical performance criteria, uh, you don't know whether the aluminium is peeling off or delaminating too soon and therefore dangerously, or late, later on, and therefore safely, do you? Well, but you, you're required to provide observations. Hmm. But so there are no criteria. No, yeah. there are no criteria. Why to not? Say. I mean, my, my guess is that, and I think there has been discussion around this point as well, and it's now also being addressed in, in the European um, context, it's an incredibly difficult parameter to quantify and to measure. And there is no simple way of doing that. And, you know, other than carrying, recording the observations as to what happens in terms of the performance. Um, and I think there's a lot of time and effort being invested in that. Um, you know, the same thing has applied to the development during the single burning item test when, um, you know, the, the, there was a need or a desire to try to quantify these parameters. And even on an intermediate scale, it's, it's a very difficult um, thing to do and to do consistently. Mr Chairman, is that a convenient moment? Yes, I think it is. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Well, we'll break there so we can all have some lunch, Dr. Smith. We'll resume at five past two, please. And again, <clears throat> please don't talk to anyone about your evidence while you're out of the room. All right? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Millett. Five past two, please. Thank you.